Right, this is the best damn leak show, but it's already the last episode of The Split. And so if people haven't seen what I was doing, obviously Dom could only appear for one episode of The Split, so I, I timed that one. It did actually just so happen. The universe clearly just wants me and Dom to talk you know, mad trash on some drama because that was actually the week when the first like bunch of like Mad Lion stuff was going crazy and then obviously then well, that was just a perfect week. So I actually thought it's quite cool. I purposely saved it like the Zabatine. Since we did the first episode and not only does that feel, especially when you check out these lists in a minute, it feels like a lifetime ago now, it feels years ago. But I thought since we're only going to do a couple this split, actually that would be a cool way to bookend it as we say, do one at the beginning and one at the end and then we're going to show in our episode compared to the other ones. Obviously we might have, we've, we have the most has happened in between then and definitely when we talk about some of the, the, what our predictions were spoiler not that great for us this is a pretty wacky split with a lot of really up and down things and actually obviously some of that will be real analysis and great narrative so I'll just start there Zabatine we'll talk about the specifics when we go through the teams I'll say where we had them ranked but you know what the lists look like. You actually made the list for me. It's not a good, it's not a good look, is it? Like, we're, like, the top part of our list is pretty brutal. And all I need to know, guys, is some of our bottom three or four names were top four at the end of the league. So what are your thoughts just in that sense of how far... It, like I said, it feels like a lifetime ago we did that first one, even though it was only a couple of months ago. Yeah, it's crazy how, like, tables have turned. But it's very hard because you've... Oh, when you make assumptions before a split, and especially before a year, you kind of think the trajectory if everything goes right yes. if the coach makes the right decisions yes. understands the draft for its players that the meta is like good to every single team at the same time which it, it isn't obviously and obviously life happens in the meantime and then you look back at your list and you're like damn you know it's like teenager pictures you're like oh yes. you remember and the like, cringy oh, man, that yes so cringe. <laughs> true true that's a good analogy actually. exactly the same yes exactly it was great times while we were there. You just don't always want to revisit it. It can be a little bit embarrassing, make your skin crawl. Now, speaking of life coming at you, obviously, if you're a gamer, most of the time you're too busy playing, aren't you? Like, you just wait for the next solo queue to pop. You're watching a video, then thinking about, like, making the runes and playing that champion. Well, here's the good news. If you don't have time to cook or you won't cook, many players I could make that joke about. Obviously, one of the cool things about this service is they just deliver the meals to your house. You just take a couple of minutes, you heat them up, and then they're there to go. So basically, reminds me a bit like of Mad Lions because what's funny is only takes a couple of minutes, only feels like they've been here for a minute, but they're actually surprisingly tasty, as we'll get to. Also, Mad Lions roster, I would imagine, it was probably less expensive, and it had sort of like a shrewd outsider's take on like what would make a good team. It's a bit like Factor Meals, because they're less expensive, and they're dietitian approved. Also, they have their Gourmet Plus line. If you want something really tasty, it can really savour. I can tell you what, some of the drama this weekend was just so incredibly rich. It reminded me of their fast upscale options the way it sustained me like their meals will you now they can give you up to between six and 18 meals a week depending on how many you want you just change it on the order you can even stop and pause and reschedule all that jazz so you can choose however many meals you want you want six do you want 18 you know that's if we were to say instead of meals that was games then 18 games is already probably two to three times more than giant x will play in any splits this year well, I'm just roasting everyone so it's all good and then obviously i will just end by saying if you think this is a good offer then why not save money on it as well as just having the product which is excellent itself but i've used services like this many times before in the past go to factormeals.com slash league show 50 as it says on the screen there and use the code league show 50 to get 50 percent off your order now just like g2 had to explain to us all again that they're the best i'll actually just explain again that's league show 50 code at factormeals.com slash leagueshow50 for 50% off. So there you go. That's the ad. Right, let's get into it. Like I said, I teased it at the beginning, but I think we just start with the funny ones. I think actually what we'll do is this. Let's actually just go in reverse order of the league. So we'll get all the, the bad ones out the way first. And then we'll be able to like, we'll contrast it against our original predictions. And then that way we can end on all the big matches and all the really good teams and all and I end on a high going to the next split. So when we had our little graphics... Last place, the joke was, our only dispute was, did we have Mad Lions or Giant X 10th? Like, we both had them 9th and 10th, but the question was, which one is it? Now, I will just say, obviously, I was the one who had Mad Lions last. 
Ninth isn't great either, but I did have them dead last in the league. So first things first, insane L for me. That is actually one of the be- bigger L's I've taken. I will say, look, you can, yeah, I could argue it again and be like, who could I have got these players? No, no, I'll just take the L. By the way, even though the Adam thing probably is why they were second, they were going to be top three this split anyway. So I have to take the L. Like they actually played way better than I ever thought they would. What were your thoughts on this team, Zabba team? Because as much as like, again, I think the the crowd thing and the whole Spanish angles made this such like a skewed topic. If we actually just take that out of the equation, just look at them playing in the game and then consider some of these are rookies. I have to say, like, mate, I actually am very impressed. I don't necessarily think these are all great players, and some of them I'm a bit critical of and think maybe we're over it, but there's a couple of players here when we get to, like, the top player in the support, obviously, and I'll even add, just logically, how the team played the coach. Like, I think these three people look like they have a very bright future in the LEC. Like, I'm kind of actually, those aspects, I'm very impressed. And then also, even how they made the team work. Like, if I had to, like, take nameplates off and just say who was a team could, like, move around the map and make decisions, actually, this team had, like, surprisingly sort of good late game macro for rookies. It's so where were you at on this team? Obviously, a shock to you too. What have you thought, good or bad? I, uh, I think I think everybody that doesn't know perfectly these players uh, <clears throat> was shocked, me included. Uh, when I did the preview in French for the French audience, I said I didn't know really well the players, so I, I couldn't really gauge. I really didn't expect them to be that good. This is my probably my favorite team that appears in the LEC in the last two years or something or three years. Okay, you know. I think it's it's so lovable to have a team that's ready to lose to try to win and not like, you know, uh, spaghetti moments and stuff like this. It's just they 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 have this idea of making a Spanish team around Elioya and try to play kind of a brute force League of Legends. They've been trying to play a brute force League of Legends for two months with a pretty good success. Uh, it's, you know, it's ready or not, here I am. That's That's really how they play. They kind of play at your face. There is, it's not like the perfection of a Korean League of Legends you might, you might expect, but it's, it's legit. Like, I don't think they do stupid things. A lot of people would say, oh, they're going for cheeses and stuff. That's not true. They just play aggressive. So they have a high risk, high reward profile. So sometimes you feel like they're, you know, um, they have a terrible game, but that's probably my favorite team to watch. I'm always excited about the Mad Lions game every single time. And, you know, I wish it was a French team, but it is a Spanish team and I'd rather celebrate than than be upset that our rivals, you know, on the paper, the, the Spanish sure. are the rivals. Of, I don't know how we ended up being that way. <laughs> no, sure. Because in traditional sports, you know, you, if you come from football, for instance, you know, the Germans and the yeah. Italians have been way more yeah, or, or, uh, opponents. Uh, in in real life, it's more the Brits. <laughs> Historically, <laughs> at least, yeah. we ended up with the, we ended up with the with Spain, and I don't know. It feels great to watch them. It feels great to see them draft because they always come with like weird ideas. All the players are very extravagant and lovable in their own way of playing. Uh, their madness is really what the LEC needs. You know, it's like when, watching LEC is is eating like bland chicken without without salt or anything. They are the spice. Like they bring some some uh, um, uh, density, I would say, you know, to, to the LEC because it gives you a match that you can look up to and be excited because you're going to see an Ivan, and you're going to see a uh, Kalista top, you're going to see something that's weird, but has been worked on enough to actually be legit on stage. And that feels great. Yeah, one thing, one of the reasons why I, I always tell people, even though normally it's very, very difficult to know what a coach is doing and how much they're doing, like what they're responsible for. This is an example of a team, just like with BDS when we get to them, where I actually think it's the most obvious you can infer the coach is doing something. Because not only did this coach, coach like, three of the players when they were in Movistar Riders. But like I say, and you allude to it there, like it's so rare that you could have like a whole side of a map be rookies and then have late game macro. Like that doesn't happen. Like players who play solo queue aren't learning that. And definitely they wouldn't have like the comms to do it, etc. Then I'd even say this as well. If you look at like who looked like they were the star players, right? If I just saw like the, on paper, who's supposed to be good, I would assume they'd be playing through like top lane. Dude, they play for, El Yoya plays for the bot lane all day long. Like they, they know what they're doing in this team. And I actually do think the Alvaro guys like the Merwin guy is really dope like I actually love his style and his champion pool but the Alvaro guy where was this guy this guy has to be like the best kept secret in the RLs I've seen in years mate he actually looks like he's a really good fucking support player like his, his champion pool also was interesting have have supports in LEC shit, shut the bed as well like, oh there was definitely a lot of downsides yeah true I've been exceptionally under underperforming I, I don't think it's it's even a a directed, you know, criticize. No, no. It's the overall, joke is, you could I even say like... Mickey X was worse, right? Even he was worse than Split. Yeah, I think overall, 
Last year, I was very happy with how supports were playing in yes. LEC. I think that was one of the positions that improved the most in the last three or four years. We didn't have support, and at some point, we know you, you had like all these very strong guys. But the fact that Hidi Song is facing a massive slump, I think it used to be like, oh, it has bad and good times. Now we yes. are more leaning towards the bad time most of the time. The absence of Trimby, the fact that uh, Targamas hasn't been performing well, Zoelis has been absent when we speak about Rogue. Not a lot of supports have shown. And I think that uh, Alvaro has played slightly better than what he was doing in EMEA, EMEA Masters. So he's definitely like playing consistently at the LEC level. And just playing without fear on stage as a support that has the responsibility of engaging and contesting vision for most of the time and most of the games, I think he has done an amazing job. They are not the best in lane, but I feel like they offset that by having mid and jungle 24-7 on their lane. Yes. And whenever Alvaro is free, then you see that his real skill is actually enabling plays around the map. He's not really good at sticking like yes. Trimby would do, sticking to the bot side of the map and making his ADCs the strongest. I, th I believe, I, I can't confirm this because I don't know people in the Spanish scene, but someone told me he is the shot caller. And dude, I could totally believe it by what you're saying. Like, I agree. Like, that was the other thing. He was making like veteran moves sometimes. You know, I think age doesn't... Uh, there is a whole... I don't really have a space to speak about that publicly, but I feel like a lot of players don't learn the game. A lot of players get veterans without ever taking the time to sit down and learn the game. I think here, no, we have enough resources on the internet that are free and you are making a good living. So even if it's paid, you know, there is a paywall. I think that most players should throughout their first three years of their career sit down and really learn the game from a positional standpoint, from tempo standpoint, and the single other positions, the constraint of every single position. A lot of players don't, but I think this new generation has had access to this material very early in their progression. So the ones who actually spend the time learning the game are way better out of the box than some people that are veterans that never took the time to sit down and actually learn the game. So what I do, think yeah, go you're going to see more people like Alvaro in the future. And then the other, the other thing I would ask is, specifically about the Merwin guy, the other reason he's been like a sensation to me, like he's way more exciting than I ever expected, is because actually, if we pick up the same topic you were saying there, whereas I agree, support was actually one of the best roles the last few years. The joke is, everyone, correctly, if you watch the LPL, used to laugh at LEC top laners. Mate, he's part of like the fact that like the top lane now has got way better in LEC. Like you could actually argue it's one of the strongest positions now. I thought he was really good yeah. as well. Mirwin played amazing. I'm I'm surprised that someone who plays fiddle top and Akali <laughs> Comet mild, it? Yeah. is uh, is is doing that. But I think it's a very good wake up call for a lot of veterans that have shown very poor performance. Yes, it's just knocking on the door. It's like if the level, if the average level of the veteran used to be bad and still not that great, then it means that. We can go with this young guy that doesn't fear anything. That was the case for Adam. I, I think yeah. Adam was a little bit like Mirwin when he when he started, sure. and then developed a unique play style around what his quirks. And that's how you want to like. That's kind of the path you want to you want to aim for when you're a young player. You want to develop your quirk into becoming kind of a standout player for what made you good at first. And Mirwin is really following that path. Like instead of going. For instance, I haven't seen a player, we'll speak about GX, but Odo Amne is really the shadow of himself yep. this year in terms of, of performance. And you really feel like he doesn't know what to pick. He's probably not even playing, like the champs that he has on stage, I don't even know if he plays them in solo queue because he's like, oh, okay, let's give me Aatrox. And you see him not doing anything during the whole, during the whole match. Whereas you see Mirwin's like, mm, give me this cheese pick that I picked yesterday in solo queue, trust me, it's good. And he does it. And people don't know. And I feel like that's the... That's the beauty of it. I'm, I'm, I'm really hoping that people like Adam and, and Mirwin are going to pave the way for uh, intrepid top laners that want to, you know, stop just handshaking on picks in, in the LEC because we might become better through that. Yes. I think it's a, it's a really good opportunity for the whole league. Yes, I also agree with the, the last sentiment, definitely, by the way. The joke is, we'll get to media later, but I'll just make this point now using Adam as the example, is, I mean, I even tweeted myself, sadly, the week before he got benched. I actually thought Adam, by the end, was the best top player to me. I know people might now say Broken Blade because of the final, but I thought he looked really, really good. And the difference is, before, I did think he was a gimmick, mate. Whereas, like, so, like, the joke before was, at Worlds, I only really gave a shit if he was playing Darren or Darius or fucking Garen or something. Like, otherwise, I knew he was going to lose. This time around, if you have those weird champions and you play the meta ones, 
Dude, that can now get you like a win in a best of five. Like that's that's big time. We didn't have that before. Like you say, if anything, top laners in Europe, they were like what some of the mid laners are now. They play three champions and it's all the meta ones and they just play those matchups. So if you go against the LPL top laner, which have the killer top, they already play the Nar and the Scion and the Renekton. So if you don't have those extra ones, they're going to fuck you up with something. Meanwhile, you could actually, you could have the angle where you have the weird pick they don't like. That's the dream. You know, must never get that against the Asians. So yeah, I think that is, that's definitely a fact. This Merwin guy would be perfect for that if he gets to an MS. I or a, or a worlds that's the only time we ever won like we we what we beat people tend to to forget the past in 2019 when g2 was at its peak the hardest opponent but the one we always beat was t1 yes and t1 struggled extremely into the draft system of g2 because yes. you ended up with zoe pike bots and yes. you had sorak <laughs> atop and you didn't know what to do against that because they had absolutely no practice against the the strong timings of such comps we will improve through innovation the way we've mostly done historically in the in the way yes. in uh, europe i think europe has always been a creative region and seeing people like Mirwin and adam is just a blessing because you gotta People think we're going to just go, you know, on top, jungle is going to be Trundle, mid, we're going to have Azir versus Oriana, and bot lane is going to be Jinx, Tam Kench, and we're going to beat uh, Genji with that. I don't think we will. No, no. So I'm very happy these people exist. Yes. Okay, so yeah, actually for Mad Lions, if you notice, there are not really any downsides to speak of. Like the joke is, I definitely flamed some of the other players during the split, but I, the final thing I'll sell Mad Lions is this, Sabatine. I also think, and this is also why I'm certain the coaching staff did a great job, is normally a rookie team can be expected to fall off the harder the games get. The joke is, they didn't even fall off in the final, mate. They looked good in the fight. If anything, they got better in the lower bracket. Like That's why even the players I criticise, like for Scovy, etc., in the playoffs, you killed it, mate. You you did a pretty good. You were better than I thought you would be. You were beating players I would have said were better than you. So by the end, I thought actually the, the playoffs, if anything, already made it even more impressive what Mad Lions did for me. Yeah, I mean they they are not. I think the it's the first occurrence in a very long time that new players have been haven't been tamed by the LEC infrastructure environment because I do understand what happens to most of these young players. They arrive. They are veterans. They see that like the veterans players are not sweating as much as they do. Uh, they don't really understand. There is the pressure of the matches and stuff. But I feel like because this Mad Lions team has been built, uh, everybody was kind of already agreeing up front with everything that's going that will happen throughout the throughout the year when they sign in. It was like we picked you because we want to make this very specific team, and so because they had this idea in mind, I think they just spend all the energy doing that instead of trying to cater to what the LEC asks you to become when you become an LEC player, which is our wake up, do your screams, then kind of mitigate what you did wrong during the screams by talking to your coach and stuff, play some solo queue and then show up on the match. Don't really know how you want to play the game because it's the, they just came like, okay, we're just going to play on their face with weird picks. We're going to play as aggro as we can. And if we lose, it's completely fine. It's our first split. And that makes a world of difference if you look at, uh, I would say, the, the, the most clear example was, for instance, Casey. That has a significant drop in performance because I think they treated the, this uh, year differently than any other game, which Mad Lions didn't. They literally just say, guys, it's the same at EMEA Master. We screamed against this guy probably right. last year already because, I mean, EMEA screamed at LEC. Uh, just go on stage and do the same thing. It's going to work. And they just did it. And it feels great. Right, okay, after that, as I said, we did have Giant X. And they look, the joke is they finished sort of seventh to eighth, so we weren't that far off. And on that one, I will say, I didn't expect Kami Cobb and Rogue to be shit, so I couldn't really know they were going to be bottom two. I don't, this one, I don't even take any golf for, because I actually will say, I'm going to have to be more critical on this one. Give me some thoughts. Here's our team. Because even though they made the playoffs, that just means not bottom two. So I don't think that really counts for much, mate. Like, when I actually watched this team play, especially in the playoffs, they were pretty lackluster, I've got to say. Like, it kind of not really a great roster, right? I mean, G GX, for me, is your friend that never played League, and it's like, oh, what should I start with? And you're like, oh, you should start with Ash or Annie. It's like, okay, I'm going to okay. just pick Aurelia. And the problem is, I think that the standards at which GX wants to play are not made for the players they have. That's it. I think there is a mismatch between the representation of the what the what the players are and what the, even the staff thinks of the players 
and what they are actually able to pull on stage. I'm not speaking about screams because, I mean, you look at the, the scream records of G2 that Roman pu pu uh, published uh, yesterday. You see that GX is doing very well in screams. I think it's a team that usually uh, you have players like Patrick, for instance, that know, are known to be very good players on scream and stuff. But when you come on stage, trying to play this Ash Varus that only T1 has been able to pilot, which has, there is a debate on what is the best early game snowball, like the best snowball team of all time. I think this T1 from last year is probably one of the best snowballing yeah, yeah. team of all time because... So I think it's so bad to arrive in a league that's middle level. I would say this is probably like a minor league at yeah, this yeah. point in terms of level. Have not the best roster there and set the standards of playing a, a, a play style that not even G2 is trying to execute because it's too hard for them. And so at the end of the day, Players lose trust in their ability to do good. Screams get worse, and you end up kind of facing a dead end on like, oh, we were shit. But you never even attempt attempted to become average. You you were only aiming to win worlds with your playstyle during a, a winter split of a minor league. So for this reason, I feel like if expectations from the staff and the players about what they can play is <coughs> is lowered for the next split, I think they can be decent because I've seen good things when they had drafts that were easier to execute, but they really went with the Korean way. And I think that's that's really... To say something nice about GX, I think they are way better than what they've shown, but nobody will ever know because they try to show the best League of Legends possible instead of showing good League of Legends. Right, if people don't get the analogy he gave was, his point is, if you were trying to tell your friend, like, pick something simple like fucking Annie, but then he just goes, I've locked it really. It's like, we've lost this game. You're trying too much. Like, you're not going to pull it off. It's not gonna I, I know what you mean on that one because the sad thing about this team was, like, when you look at even about, at all the hopes, almost every player didn't live up to what you'd hope. Like, as you say, Odo Amni, by the way, probably one of the most consistent players ever in the LEC. He was consistently bad this split. It was fucking garbage. And he, by the way, he even looked like he was bombed out. The Peach guy, I still think, doesn't really do anything. Look, he doesn't do much bad, but I just think he just doesn't do anything. I, I don't like the fact <laughs> that we are stealing uh, spots. It's weird, isn't it? From ERL players. I'm honest yeah. with that. And I, have, I just want to say the disclaimer before people pick my words outside of context. I have absolutely nothing against Korean players. I'm very happy to have Korean players. I've, I've interacted, coached Korean players. I absolutely love it. It's just, I feel like Korean players should be, uh, or importing should be a last resort. It's like you're in the middle of the year. You have, so the, the fact that they imported Peach last year, I do understand. The fact that they kept him, despite the fact that we have plenty of decent junglers in uh, in sure. Eros, is uh, is kind of a butthurt for me. Uh, for the result they get. It's like, it doesn't matter. If he was prime mile rank, you know, or prime rain over 2015, no problem. But yes. if you import, it's like, do you think Peach is going to stay seven years in GX? Do you think he's going to sell in the way Ignar did, for instance, or the way Korjaja did? Most Korean players don't. So in a year or two, if he decides to go back to Korea, what have you invested on? That's the only critique to teams that do that. It's not about the, the, the year you have the Korean player. It's completely fine. But you do understand that most Korean players will not help you build the team that you want to have in three, four years, the way, for instance, BDS did, right? BDS have one import, but it comes at the end of the building project, not at the beginning. So it, it makes the, the whole uh, multi-year project much, much more consistent. Uh, on that note, yeah, I would say he's random. I'd say Ignar has played fine. I think Ignar has his... I think the LCS is missing Ignar. I think he has been the best player of GX this split because he has been able to switch back to his engaged profile uh, and help GX secure the few wins they had. I think he was one of the of the, the key players, but the lackluster is definitely Odo Amne. And it feels so bad, man. I, when I see the drafts, it, it, you know what I think when I see the drafts of, uh, of GX? Odo Amne is saying the Dardoch thing, pick me anything so we can lose in peace. Right. When he picks Aatrox, I'm like, bro, like, what, he definitely looks Aatrox checked out. Right I know here. what you mean. Yeah. 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 And and it feels just bad for GX. To be frank, it just feels bad because I don't see where this team is going. Yes. And then the other problem they have, in my opinion, is because I definitely agree on the Peach thing. His problem is just this. If I took the nameplate off, I would never know it's a Korean plate. It just looks like a vanilla, not that good jungler. So I, I'm with you. You either get someone like Malrang where the idea is at least he plays like a crazy style that's going to do something dynamically to your team, or just go get the next best ERL player. Because put it this way, when we talk later about SK Gaming, the Isma guy has shown, you can't just ignore talent that's in the ERL. Like that guy actually, if I could tomorrow 
flick my fingers and put Isma instead of Peach. I'd do it in an instant. I'm because I wouldn't fuck SK up like that. But <laughs> for Giant X, it'd be way better. Like, could I have done something? And then the other player, obviously, that was the problem was their gamble was an ERL gamble. They gambled on Jackies as the mid laner. And I've just got to say, even though I won't say he was terrible, he only had a couple of good games for me. He had a couple of pop-offs. He had a couple that were, okay, there's some potential here. But I get the vibe by the fact they brought this guy in, mate. I mean, it is mid lane in Europe. Like, you are building... I don't care what anyone says. Unless you're a really clever coach, to some degree, you're always building around mid lane. It's always going to be super important. So that is the player where if we gamble on him, okay, it is only the first split, but it's got to work eventually. Like, that player can't be the worst player on our team. So what did you think of the Jackie's angle? I think he's legit for ADC. I think okay. when you look at the first, for instance, the first split of... Uh, who has started the first pit of nuke the first pit of vto the first pit first pit is always very hard i think even exactly his first split last winter was not that great uh i think jackie's has a lot of flows uh but he passes the bar that for instance chocolate and ricker haven't right chocolate and ricker when they arrived they you saw the gap because they were straight a liability to their team when they yes. were playing yes uh, i think second for instance this split has been mostly a liability uh instead of being an asset for casey and not being able just to, you know, sustain lane, yep. be able to pop off in some team fights. Understand, even if you have two or three key moves in a split, that's fine. I mean, it's your first it's your first split with, with <coughs> this small amount of experience. The fact that he wasn't even playing in a major ERL last year, what is shown, even though he, he tends to be a kind of a leader, which I don't think these profiles are very consistent in terms of results. Like you play only these melee, very aggressive champs, you don't know how to control with control mages and stuff. Not that leader can't, but it's no, just no, not sure. his favorite playstyle. Um, because of this, like that's for me the only warning sign I have from Jackie's. But in terms of individual performance from the clicking, the pure clicking, he has probably been, I would say, second to best. Or okay. in, in his team, I think he has not been worse than Odo or Peach. I think Patrick was fine, but not great either. So for this reason, and if you look his direct matchups, Mid lane is pretty stacked this year, and I don't think he has shown weakness in lane the way, for instance, Casey did, where you felt like sure. enemy mid was on bot lane 24-7. Jackie's was holding on pretty fine. So he's, I, I, watch, I wait and I keep my words for the end of the year because I think rookies deserve at least three speed, especially with this crappy format of the LEC. But we'll see at the end of the year. I'm pretty sure he's legit and he will stay in the LEC. Okay. I will say, because we're going to get there later, the two teams that I actually, it's not, I, what's funny is I don't have harsh words for them. I just have actually the saddest words, which is I just don't think they can do anything. It is Giant X and, in my opinion, Rogue. Those rosters are just terribly constructed. Like, because here's the problem, mate. Notice how when we talk about these rosters, there's not really any one player can even be close to the best. Like, remember, you can be in a bad team and still be like popping off yourself or playing well into stuff. These teams just look like you've got the wrong pieces and they're almost neutralizing each other. So that's the the other bomber for me if we talk about some of the others like the joke is coming cop could level up they could get shit together these teams i have no hope for that's the worst thing so if we go next well the joke is i actually did have bds here but even zabatine even zabatine he's french you can know he speaks french guys even he had them seventh to be fair so neither of us had bds high up but here's where i think we start the convo and the joke is this is probably just going to be a glazing session for bds because there's so many positives like here's the reason why i know this team is very well coached zabatine aside from the fact Spoiler, I do actually know Striker a little bit from Kali Corp and BDS, etc. So I've also had the benefit of asking him questions, etc. But again, if I was looking as an outsider who knew nothing, here's the immediate reason that I know this team has to be well coached. Because one of the reasons I put them so far down is because I watched last year and I saw how they played. And if it's like, bro, the reason you can't remove Crown Shot, no matter what he did at Worlds, is because he was the one you were fucking playing around all day long. And he even looked in the game at the time, like when he got his resources, he shot cold some of the game around himself. Now, true, I get there's two factors here. One, I've heard from the coaching angle that like that they thought that was too one-dimensional, essentially. Essentially, what happened to Crowley was when he couldn't play the hyper carry anymore, it didn't work as well. We all know he's not like the Zeri main. Like, that, that, it's true, that part did sort of not work as well later in the year. And then the other part, which you don't have to get into too much, but I'll tease it, is... I have heard there was some sort of like a potential like ultimatum scenario. Like, is it Crowley we keep or is it Adam? Because spoiler, they don't get along, guys. Like they're, they're not only are they players who both want like play to my lane, but they're just like personalities that like in English we say chalk and cheese. They don't go together at all. Like they talk. But now here's the funny thing, Zabatine. I would have said before the year, because I only saw that one style of BDS. Coaches have fucked up here. They picked the wrong guy. Why would you pick that guy? This is how I know they killed it. 
because they really did completely invert the way the team plays. Play to top player for Adam. The joke of the ice guy when I was critiquing him is, you know, Crowdy. His job was not to be Crowdy. The amazing thing was they actually did play like a totally different style. And not only did it work, like, by the way, I think if Adam had been and they'd have been in the final. And the way the final went, fuck knows. Maybe they even could have given G2 a good game. And the last thing I'll say is this. I do think, actually, once this, once they all played for him, Adam was the best top player for me. I thought he was really good, actually. It actually justified his style. He wasn't just some, like, I mean, you can't say one trick anyway. He's like a three trick or whatever. He's not that even more. He's just a really good player now, guys. Like, he actually, this team actually, like, it's again, fabulously coached team, might be. Like, it, again, worked so well together. I even, like, the joke is when I critique some of the players, what they're not getting is I'm sort of saying individually, you aren't the best player, but the fucking team is way better. It's, it's more than the, some of the parts we say in English. So give me your thoughts on BDS. Obviously, we were both really wrong on this one. I mean, I, I was wrong, and and I think that the reason uh, I was worried about still showed, but they got a way more offset that I thought, you know, by by the good systems. And I can't praise BDS enough for once in multiple year being an organization that does the thing right. You see the way like C9 does most of the things right in NA, and they get yes. they get ahead of everyone. Yes. I think that BDS, like, you have to understand that the price to be second with such a cheap roster has been to be last and dead 10th and keeping their projects, you know, like in, on track for the last two years and a half. So now they're harvesting the fruits that, you know, they went through all the seasons with the tree and now they're harvesting the fruits, right? That's finally summer, they can, they can eat the juicy fruit. So I'm very happy because... It's not only uh, the, the, the you, you mentioned about Striker, but they had a really tough choice to make because they had a pretty good year last year. Yeah. And Striker was not the head coach, and there was Gotu and these two guys. I mean, I've Gotu was my assistant coach, and I think it's a very hard thing to promote someone and ditch your head coach because there are probably dynamics that they thought was more important. Meaning that the person who's above the coaches and probably even above the general management at BDS, like the, the sport direction, which we mention, don't mention enough in esports, had the vision that Striker was the man they needed in terms of culture for this group of players. And therefore, they decided to say, to give him more tools to push his vision about his player to the fullest. What's the, what's the outcome of this? You see Nuke and Sheo, who has shown in the, in, in the past years very weak showings, quite often. Not they're bad, because they can play very high, but they're not consistent. They've been able to be way more consistent this bit. I've seen still Sheo on his main Vi do flash, Q flash with Vi and fail it two times sure. in a split on his main. This has to be fixed, guys. Like, this is super important for the future of BDS. Th despite that, Nuke played probably the best split of his career. Sheo played the best split of his career. Adam is now a well-rounded top laner. Ice was, yes, was the, the, the right pick for what they wanted to do. And Labrov, I I don't know what they did to Labrov. He smurfed, for him didn't he? He was unbelievable. Well. He might I, actually I, been, man. I actually think he was the best support player, mate. He was really fucking sick. I I don't know. Like, I was lost. I lost hope for Labrov. I was part of the people that were like, it's been a year, it's been yeah, two years. Yeah, it was years, years, maybe three or four years, yeah. Yeah, I was like, uh, this, when is this player going to show what he's capable of? And and know everything fails to click, like it's clicking. And I, I don't think it's, yeah, I, I would completely align with you. I don't think it's random. I think Striker, I know him a little bit too. Uh, I spoke with, I speak with him when, when I have the chance to. I like people in this industry that are ready to die to win. Yes. You know, this is the same thing as Mad Lions. It's like, they have an idea and they're like, I'll do it. If it fails, I'd be guilty of doing it, but I'll do it to the fullest. Yes. And Striker had a vision for this team, is executing it very well. And I think even showing that you can bench your best player <laughs> before means that the culture of BDS is more important than the results. And yes. it has been the case for the last two years and a half. And for this speci very specific reason, thank you so much for BDS for not being like the other teams. Not selling you soul for a, a winter split or a semi-final or some type of like chocolate medal that nobody's going to remember in the next two years and be like, this is our goal. Like, we want to have this culture of performance and we'll just, you know, stand our ground versus any player in the world. And if we have to lose everything, we will. I love, I love this mindset because I think that's the only way you end up winning.
Yeah, I also think, to echo what you're saying here, the reason why it was so ballsy to do this is exactly because I don't think any other coach almost would do this, Sabatine. I actually think the obvious thing another coach would do would go, fuck, look how good we were in spring. Run it back. And then you run the exact same roster back. And here's the reason why, if you were the coach, that might even be a smarter idea or a safer idea. Because then if it goes badly... People will see in the server, like maybe Crowney doesn't play as well. Then people will just go, Crowney wasn't good enough, right? Meanwhile, if this roster really had have gone where we thought they were going to be and be like bottom of the league, everyone would have said exactly, blame the coaches. They fired Crowney. Like, it's actually all, the gamble here was enormous in terms of like public reputation. I'll even throw this in there as well. Just like with Carmen Cop and Yamato, Crowney is literally one of the people who goes on those streams and is friends with all the talent and content creators. So you were also walking into a minefield there because those people are going to be so horny to flame you if you ever start to fail with this lineup and be like, see? And th- by the way, the whole thing would have all been like, you know, like hashtag free crowny because remember, he's still on the bench. Like, bring him back, put him back in. Just just, just admit you were wrong, put him back in. But as you say, they gambled on a massive vision and they also did it building off what they did last year. So I'm with you, the striker guy. Like, he's, all, he's actually shown, to, I have mad respect just for that move alone. And then if you add in, by the way, the way they did handle the drama with the Adam benching, etc., I think that was masterfully played, mate. Because what was brilliant about it was, and, and as a coach, I wanted to ask you about this, actually specifically from your angle, which is, first of all, there are very few players will ever bench a star player. Spoiler, this guy benched Crowley completely and then benched Adam in for a playoff thing for actually This guy's sure he's willing to pull the trigger if he believes in it and, and you go against what he says. But the more important thing I'd say is this. I actually think the statement he released and the fact he waited till the very end to do it was a masterclass of PR. Because if you read that statement, it's not at all vitriolic. It's not at all blaming people. He actually just very calmly lays out and he actually uses what you call like DS escalating language which makes it sound less and less bad and suddenly when you read that statement it just seems like essentially like it's almost like between between the lines he's like look Adam had a little moment I've sorted it with him he understands who's in charge and you know maybe he's back in next play like it was perfect essentially what was brilliant about it was it allowed Adam to not feel humiliated it allowed him to actually walk it back and now by the way they played the game they've done what they've done he's had his moment where he got benched if he comes back next split and he plays well he's, and he's one of the best players again There'll be no problem for anyone. This will be a blip on the radar and it'll never have to be brought up again. Whereas that could have been a really serious moment. That could have been some like feud. You know, sometimes like in football, the star players have feud with the coach. They have to pick, right, which one do we fire and ultimate. That could have could have gone that way and it didn't. Like somehow they like put the genie back in the bottle as they say. I thought it was I thought this was fabulous the way they handled this drama, mate. Dude, I, I feel like we are so not used to it anymore in esports. <laughs> yeah. Just it's a bench. I I I that's something that's I, I really felt when I was a coach is like the weight of, of benching is is disproportionate in this industry. Yes. Because I feel like, you know, I had I had to make benching choices. Uh, I mean, we, we had visa issues in 2019, so I had to open with my academy team. So it was Dardo, Gate, like not definitely not the roster we planned to work with, but Arrow couldn't join, so it was impossible to play. So I decided that at some point in the season, uh, Crown came to me and was like, oh, uh, I need a break. So I, I put Scarlet the next week and everybody was like, this guy Zabutin is probably out of his brain. And it's like, no, I mean, this is things happen in a team. They're real humans. So sometimes, you know, you, you, you got to take. And so because of all these things and all these intangible you don't have, I knew it was not that serious because if it was that serious, Adam would have been kicked from the team. The reason he's kept is because I think that there are boundaries between staff and players and you have your team culture. And it is extremely important to not bend the knee when players do these things because yes. you have a deadline, because in sports, there will always be a deadline. So you always have the chance of showing and leading by example of being, yes, okay, we'll bench our best player for this split and we'll explain very calmly why. And and that's just, it was very factual at the end of the day. It was, yeah, I mean, it was heated in the moment. Everybody understood, but because we are a good team, we're going to make sure that everybody uh, endure the consequences of their action and then resume the like everything was normal again. And I think that's, I mean, that's that's fantastic. I mean, BDS is very hard to criticize, man, because yes. even like we're, sp- we're spoken about Adam, but I think every player has been out, per- like overperform oh, sure. individually. Nuke has been so good. Like, of course, he doesn't have a lot of picks. But Nuke has been extremely good with Azir, for instance, and his Oriana Shockwave have been amazing. And I'm very surprised as well about Shio. Shio reminds me sometimes of uh, all the Yankos, you know, the guy that goes in between the lines, okay. dodge the vision, 
and finds this very specific like open kill at like 15 minutes when the games are very very hard to break he's been this guy very consistently this split so i mean props to be this i'm very happy for the region that we have a team that gatekeeps all the bad ones yes yeah, so that's if you actually great, beat yeah. BDS, you don't deserve to play g2 by the way, unfortunately, that was actually one of the things I actually remember. Now, that's actually one of the, the things that triggered them is I basically made a tweet. Now I've remembered, by the way, it's just something we were talking about before, where what happened was I made that point, basically. I actually give an analogy to Counter-Strike, if people know, because in Counter-Strike, we have a similar team. It's called Virtus Pro, this Russian team. And they have a really strange style of play, but it's super coherent. And so if you can't play against that style, you're not going to be a top three team in the world. And so my analogy was, though, this is where they thought I was BMing them. Uh, my point was, though, my dream would be a team like BDS, like that would be like fourth or fifth, and then we'd have a fucking amazing LEC but my point is if they're second or third that probably implies they aren't passing the other teams aren't passing the test so even though they took that as a diss against them it actually wasn't but whatever I understand the way things go when Thorin says things so what I would say is to bring it back I actually also agree on the nuke angle like here's what people don't know this is where timing is everything because I obviously did flame the fuck out of math that last one but by the way the last series which to be fair also didn't have the normal top lane and they did like put a brand new player in that last series was far and away the worst League of Legends he played this whole split before that he was actually doing like you say well probably better than most other splits including by the way I think even the split they were going to win last year and actually individually was looking a lot but he was a top half mid laner yeah yeah for sure I mean uh, lane wise he still struggles but team fights he was much better but I think it's very easy to, man to maneuver in team fights as a carry if you have everybody doing their job yes. I think people put too much emphasis on carries for instance we're probably going to speak about Casey at some point, but you look at Upset, and he hasn't done, made a lot of mistakes in this team fight. but if the support is not contesting the vision, if the front laner is not sitting in the front lane, if the flank is not covered, you literally have one flanker that comes on you, you yes. get one shot, and you're like, oh, Upset hasn't been... No, the, the truth is, for carries, you need everybody else to make space for you. Yes. And I think that BDS has found a really good system where, because Adam's so aggressive, because Labrov has been picked picking this Blitzcrank, all this engaged champ that he's really good at. And Shiro has done a lot of, like, Shiro has taken the short end of the stick for the whole split, taking, you know, kind of the pick that nobody wants or playing these kind of blind pick champions that help drafting better for, for uh, the, the lanes. But they're all ready to make space and die for the carries. And then you see Nuke arriving at the end of the team fight or, or Ice, and you're like, oh, this guy is popping off. Of course he's popping off. Nobody has spells against him because everybody else before him did, did his job. So props to BDS. Everything, I, I, it's very hard for me to find something negative to say to BD, about BDS. The only thing I would mention is I think that in terms of individual skill, I can still see a limit. There is kind of a glass ceiling for them where if other teams... The, the obvious really problem better, is if they go to Worlds or something, you start to wonder, right? Even in EU... Like if Natic starts to have good systems, right. if uh, I'm speaking really like individual players, yeah. if Vitality stops shitting the bed, I think it's very hard for a team like BDS to outplay a team like Vitality right. if Hillisong is not 0, 7, 0 at 12 minutes. You know, it, it becomes much harder to play because you see these players missing spells. And that doesn't seem very bad because they win the game at the end. But if the macro is 50-50 and they start to play from even ground against other teams, you're going to see that these, these flows are going to become way more apparent. These miss spells, these miss yes. hooks, this splash in the wall and stuff. So I'm really careful about making BDS a super top team that's going to be contender at the early stage of the year because I think there is a margin of progression for a lot of teams and BDS is not part of them. I don't think they can be because this individual level is much slower to fix to address, yes. right? It's a, it's a slower process. Yeah, on, the, on that note, I think what I would say is this is another reason why, even though I wasn't dissing them, they took it as a diss, right? Because essentially, in League, if you're not the LCK and the LPL, you always have to ask, how would this look against much better opposition? I mean, we already... The reason why, even though sometimes they chalk, it, it, it's easy to say the best teams, the best LPL or LCK team, is we see them play the best teams now. We know what they can do against the best possible players. The problem BDS have is this. When I watched them in the league, a reason I also saw them as like the ultimate gatekeeper, although the joke is they end up being a contender because the other teams didn't get through the gate. The reason they were the ultimate gatekeeper is, dude, this team wasn't snowballing anyone the first like 10, 15 games or so. 
but like this was the team that would just be like even or slightly behind early, but they'd get to the lake, and then when they got to those objectives and team fights, though, they would just the joke is they were doing like mid European and JDG, they just win the fight from behind. But here's the joke, right? I did have someone make a comment on one of my episodes where I said that, and they were like, Yeah, but that's hypocritical because you praise JDG. Like, listen to what I just said before. JDG doesn't have like aliens to play like Space Jam where they're off, oh, we're behind against the aliens. They're like, no, they already can win. I already saw them win against the best teams in the world from behind as well. The problem BDS have is if they have that exact same style and they don't have a way better early game and, and maybe a bit more star power from certain positions, the problem is you get to that team fight against the T1, you aren't winning it. You're not, I'm sorry, like that. Gen G, it's over. Like at BLG, these teams will murder you in that team fight if they're even slightly ahead. So that, even G2, that, man, I think you're oh, going sure. just too far. I think okay, you're right. in the series against G2. <laughs> They, yes. they got 3 0 And I, I, I firmly think that uh, the, 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 the problem you have, right? Because as a team, when you're bottom team, you have bottom team problems. They have the runner-up problem, which is you think you're good, and then you get destroyed against the best team. Yes. And that breaks your belief and your systems. And I think a lot of the frustration that probably led even to the Adam problem has stemmed from bad scream quality. And probably playing against G2 as well, because it was in the kind of a honeymoon phase. And then you, you have this really check of... I've, yeah, got, guys, I've got a detail for you, mate. This is something I actually got wrong initially, but I checked it. I've got it right now. You know, when they released the Remain Scrim thing, dude, there's one yeah. that leaps off the page, which is literally a few days before Adam was benched. G2 went 7-0 in scrims against yeah, BDS. Yeah, that's very specific. Day. Bro, that, there's two things that are obviously time. inferred from that. One... I could imagine that might make Adam a bit more annoyed if he's getting banged out in scrims. And then two, if I was striker, this is why it's also genius to do the benching then. Because you're probably not going to win the final anyway if you make it. So if there was ever the one time you really could give up a playoff spot, this is probably it because G2's winning the split anyway. You know what I mean? What do you think? Dude, uh, <laughs> it was Valentine's Day. They got 7-0. Seven, seven there is a good joke to make, right? I'm not going to make it. You, guess, yes. you, can, you, can, you can guess it at home. Exactly. Um, well, the joke goes like this. I hope at least G2 bought them dinner before they fucked them. That's 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 the joke, right? It's one of those ones, right? Yeah, I'm guessing, yeah. Right? Just a bug of chocolate first. Uh, there you go. Okay. But yeah, I, I, feel, I, feel, I feel like people don't understand that this really breaks teams, like getting 7-0, because... Course. If you if you ever try to become good at a game and you have a rival, I know it doesn't really happen in like serv multiplayer service game like League of Legends, but if you play, for instance, fighting games or something, sometimes you have a nemesis. You have someone that's very hard. And this person is kind of the gate between you and the projection you have of yourself. And, and you're really grinding and kind of obsessed on beating this person. And when, when you get a reality check the, the way they did, a lot of things crackles. Like, like you see that the flows that you had are actually much deeper than where they are. And this reality check is mentally very tough. It's a very, very harming process for anyone. And I think that through this process, they probably realized that, oh, it's going to be way harder. And the frustration probably, yeah, we've had and started there. So BDS has all the green lights as an org on League of Legends, right? That I wish Fnatic and, and Vitality and a lot of other teams had years ago. So I'm very uh, um, optimistic for them. <coughs> but with the players they have right now, I am not set on saying they're going to end up the year top three because there are projects with good players, better players individually than BDS that might wake up. And I hope they do. But at the same time, if I hope they do, I hope that BDS individually is going to get better because this team that get, that breaks you at fight the way that one did, is a really exciting outlook on the LEC. Like I, I like this idea of having different play style, having MDK that plays at your face, having G2 that plays these weird picks, and having this BDS super strict G German efficiency. Even though they are like Swiss German efficiency League of Legends, we go on Drake, we beat you at Drake. If you can't do that, we'll win the game. And I really like these kind of checks in leagues that in in, in uh, tournaments. They are very important. So yeah, just props to BDS uh, overall. The Best Damn League Show is brought to you by our exclusive betting partner, which is, of course, Esports Bet, the industry's leading crypto odds matrix. And they have a really great promotion right now that everyone can do. This isn't one of those first-time ones only. And this actually is a limited-time offer one that is especially for LFN fans. So what you do is go to the promotions part here, not up at the Esports part where you do the bets. Go to promotion, and you'll see there's a few different ones, but I'm going to bring your attention to the 777 one here. The key aspect here and by the way once you get onto this page you've obviously got to make sure if you go over there that you select your 
currency, you agree, apply, make sure you add the bonus, you've got to manually do it here, but this is the way it works. It's still going to run for 300 days, so it's got quite a long time, and the way this works is you can deposit and receive a 200% bonus to the maximum amount of 200 USDT or equivalent in another cryptocurrency. Obviously, you can see all the details down there. Instead of just the classic one where you have to be the first-time depositor, this is one everyone could do, but you could obviously only do it once. The minimum deposit amount is 10 USDT or equivalent, and as I say, it's a applicable actually for all supported cryptocurrencies. So check it out and get more from your crypto at eSports Bet. Yes. And then even though, like you said about looking at the old pictures when you're young, just even seeing on paper that, we had, that I had Rogue above BDS already makes me like, because <laughs> of how bad Rogue obviously was. But the joke is, mate, mm. well, I had Rogue in my seventh spot. They obviously ended up ninth. You had them as eighth, so we weren't that far off. And I'll tell you what, this is one of the only teams, mate, I actually think we did nail. Because here's what I remember us talking about. We talked about the fact that, like, one of the reasons to predict them to win games was they had strong players, potentially mechanically, right? I will just say, guys, that's basically the only reason they won that G2 game. They did inexplicably beat G2 and then go back to being... Fucking resident sleeper, just trash, weren't they? But here's the reason why I actually don't feel bad about this one. Because part of my prediction that they'd be all right was last year, even when the Koi, obviously Rogue, they've changed it. That's why it's tricky that Mad Lions is Koi, but we know Rogue was Koi last year, right? On that team, I actually did think Larson was still really good, even though they were bad. So I was like, mate, he is the ultimate floor raiser mid. He also played quite bad this split, in my opinion. So I think if you add those things together, they just never did get off. Like I said, this is like I said to the Giant next one. This roster, I don't know how it ever works. You know, I don't even think it fundamentally was bad aside from Larson playing below par, but even if he played great, I don't know how... The, like, the joke is, best case now, they might have been like sixth or something, you know, like, I don't think there was really a future for this team. Where, where are you at on this squad? Obviously, in theory, they're making this swap for top player, right? Um, I'm just I'm just sad for this team, man, because I... I, I... All the players in this team deserve to be able to play in a team that uh, uses them well. But it's just the perfect assembly of players that will never be able to play together. Like you you just got someone to play pure lane with with comp. It's a, it's a comp as well as upsets. The biggest, uh, over the time, I think the biggest mistake I've seen with them is trying to snowball there early because they are so good in mid game that if you actually go 0, zero, zero they are very good players. You don't right. need more than that. And uh, and you, you you see that for instance in in um, there is a team that I, I think for instance uh, Vitality when Ili Sang doesn't die twenty times you see that Karzi is playing by himself he has the same profile as as all these guys but he he doesn't mind playing alone and because of that they have way more presence in in the early game around mid and so they are able to enable the the mid laner in, in this team for instance so I think there are systems in which you do not have to stay in bot lane 24 seven and play an enchanter for your ADC to be able to click. Because plot twist in solo queue doesn't happen and he still wins games. And in previous teams as well. But the problem is where are you gonna move? If Zoedis leaves bot and goes mid, he has a guy that likes to have five CS lead on Azir and call it a day until 20 minutes. So is he gonna go top? He has a Jace player. Do you think Jace player? Do you think Jace is a good champion for European playstyle? Probably not, right? Like playing it's probably this probably one of the worst. Uh, probably one of the worst. Yeah. So I mean, you've saw, <laughs> you've seen it. There was a blind Jace uh, this this last week, I think, and it went poorly as well. Like Jace is just not not a good European champion. So my issue is where is Zoedis going? Where is Mark Quinn going? Where are these guys? What's the win condition? Mad Lions probably have on the paper worse laner than Rogue, but at least. Their plan is just, okay, even if we're worse, if we run with Elioia somewhere and we press our button, we might win the game. They, ha they have no plan because there is no... I don't think there is any single... I'm pretty sure the, vo the voice chats on, on, this, on this very specific team is very players broadcasting their game. It looks um, like there's no I'm shot caller, right? Yeah, it's, it's broadcasting. It's so they're speaking about the way... I have a pretty big spike. Okay, I'm strong. Uh, recall, I need 300 goals. Uh... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and shop. Uh, guys, can you wait? I need to do red buff and then I'll come. All these things completely useless, right? What you want to know is what everybody needs to do in like 30 seconds in the next wave or next two waves. And so I really feel like it's a solo queue. It's pretty much an in-house and I don't see the future bright for them because the, the, the way you change that is you need to change jungle support at once. Either you change the jungle because you think the support is good. Either you change the support because you think the jungle is good. Either you change buff and you go for something that's way like more coherent, 
but you gotta change that because even if you change the top laner, it's not gonna change shit. Like you, you have to have people willing to sacrifice somewhere on the map to enable someone. And once you have someone fed, you can probably start playing the game. I've got an angle for you, Zabatine. Here's an interesting one. Because obviously, in theory, we are in the esports winter and people can't really just spend more money. It's not like past years where the joke was, the way you know people like Vitality had money is they would just add more players. They would just sign another big... They'd be like, we've just added upset to the roster. Like, How much money have you got? Like, you've already spent all that money on perks and on Fari. Like, what the fuck? So that is not going to happen this year, guys. But here's why I actually think the solution is, because you nailed it on the Rogue one, is notice on some of these teams, we're not saying like, oh, all these players aren't LEC level. Get them out of the LEC and players. No, no. Some of them were just saying, like, I think Rogue's a great example. Most of these players, they're just not in the right team. But you look at the other teams, these teams could use these guys. Like, the joke is, I actually think the next meta, instead of just sign players between the splits, should be this. If you're the teams, it could be Carmen Corp, Giant X, Rogue, maybe even Vitality. These teams all have a bunch of strong players. They just don't necessarily have the right mix. I think the next move is to do it like football. Do a trade that's equivalent. Yeah, that way there's no... Con the contracts stay the same. Like, the joke would be, what if... I, I'll give you a random example. I don't know that I'd actually do this move, but I'm just going to give you a random one. If you want to change up the jungle in Rogue, well, I do think actually Douglas had problems in Vitality. It didn't look like he fit. Maybe Marcoon's better in Vitality and Douglas could do something. In, you know, this is just an example. You could do trades like this. As long as, you, as, long as the contract makes sense, you can swap back and forth. That way, we're not spending more. But And by the way, we both potentially, if it's the right deal, we both get the right trade out of it. We can improve our level. <laughs> right seems obvious you're, you're you're new to piss uh Thorin, because you know how it works it's like ha 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 we are all bad but i'm gonna make sure you're just worse than me <laughs> that's that's how True. that's how yes. the, the, the western yes. esports market works yes if, if anyone knows like i've and i've tried to be as vocal as you can obviously there are like information you can't disclose but back in my time when i was doing the off season and i think it's still the case for most coaches and general manager it's like you kind of know which player you want to work with like that's the truth it's like you you Basically, I would say one coach, one every five coach has exactly the team he wants. Yes. And there is 10 teams per league, meaning that there is one, maybe two teams per league where the coach and the players are like, yay, we're all working together. Most yes. of the case, it's like, we really wanted this guy. This guy really wanted to play for us, but his team knew that. And so they decided to put a super like unreal price on him to make sure we never get the players we want. And they shipped it to NA to avoid competition, yep. for instance. That's and then classic. we had to go last minute when we had a verbal agreement to the ARL and get that guy that we don't think is as good, but we had to go with someone. This happens most of the time. Like this is the norm. Yes. If, if people, you need to put that in your head. This is the norm. This is how the market works. So Rock probably ended in this situation where they're like, oh, uh, Marcon is out of SK. Do, do, do you want to work for us? And Marcon was like, yeah, sure, guys, let's go. Uh, let's go rogue. And it doesn't feel like Marcoon is generally playing uh, his play style, but he has to play the champ he plays because, because he's playing with Larson and Comp, and Larson and Comp needs to carry. But Larson and Comp can't carry because to carry, they need assistance from a jungle. But Marcoon doesn't play this style, so suddenly you're asking, oh, do I need to play Irelia blind top every single game? And he can't do that. Or you're asking, I don't know, Caps to play Azir every single game. Like, that's not the way he plays. So it is. It, this is why I feel sad because some teams usually, and that's why probably you and I feel lost of hope for them. It's they the result, like they're the loser of the off season because in this game of the musical chair of everybody trying to put, you know, sticks into each other, you know, bike wheels, um, someone loses more than the other. And that's Rogue that has on the paper a lot of individually good players that will not... That, you, imagine... The amount of coaching staff you need to make these players work. You yes. need to create individual system for each of these players in a way that they can still be selfish while connecting with uh, other teammates. Extremely hard to do. So I'm very sad for Rogue because like they have to change players. That's the only team in the LEC right now where I'm like, if you guys don't change player, I guarantee you will end up in the same spot. Yes, especially to, as we pointed out about the big teams like BDS and MAD, especially if the other teams get better, you're going to be in an even worse spot if you're rogue. This is also why the hard thing right now is I feel like because the money's gone away and now GMs and teams, especially with this like national scanning, are getting way more power in the server. The other thing about this last off season is I feel like it was the last one where it was the awkward one where players still got too much power. Because if people don't know, I will just say right now, even though I like both these guys, they obviously big them up all the time, both Larson and Upset had a bunch 
bunch of options of where they could have gone and they got to have some say in basically what team they ended up on and so spoiler like I can blame the teams for recruiting them but like, you guys joined bad projects too like you, if you join a team that like doesn't have certain things you need like yes once you're locked in the contract I can say like I would have out like upset like it's not really your fault like you, they're, like you were saying they're, like there's a lot lots of other things that never allowed you to play but you chose to put yourself there you did you essentially put yourself in jail and then once you're in jail it's like I'm like he's in jail it's like you didn't have to be there so I hope in the future actually I'm with you I hope we go more towards the org side because if you notice it's only the org can do what you're asking which is do a total holistic approach of like I'm going to put these play a player's always doing a thing of like well I'll play with him but I don't know about him I'm not sure they can't see the bigger picture like that it has to be the org if you want it to it, like, and by the way I'd say it's been proven out by teams like Mad Lions and BDS if you let them pick it look they might not pick the players I want but it might be better than a bunch of like a solo Q all star team like Rock or something Jungberg right? was good at this Jungberg yeah. was very good at this I think you had him in shows and yes. every time he was picking it's like I is like I might not I, I remember the time you know he, he parted away with Chocolat and he took Nug Nug back and yep. he was oh, he got very, mega flames, everybody yeah. was very heavily criticized yep. for it but the fact that he got Jungberg and I mean there is as well the fact that he, he was able to recruit me kicks <laughs> that's a that, helped. that did after. help that did help uh, but but I would say you know it's not always the the sharpest knife you need you know it's like if you if you're serving yourself butter you probably don't need the sharpest yes. you know Japanese knife uh, and and that's 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 where it is I I still think that people like Irrelevant people like Mirwin Frescovi Alvaro Supa uh, Vitio back in the days you can look there is a plethora of decent LEC level players yes. in Euros. Unf I don't know if it's fortunately or unfortunately because it can might mean that the LEC is bad or the era system is very strong. I I lean more towards one, but I won't say which. Um, I feel like because of the gap being so narrow, it is so stupid not to go for the cheap options. It is so stupid. I don't really understand what is at risk for these orgs because... If you're not in the top three in the LEC, you do not exist anyway. So please, at least try. Like, give it a try. I feel like, for instance, going with Zoedis was not a problem. But if you want to go with Zoedis and these super carries, please do a service to Markun. Let him go to a team where he's going to be able to... Because Markun is doing a disservice to his own career by being a bad... bad, bad because people will think he's a bad jungler. He's not... Look at SK last year. He was one of the best players yeah. in SK. I don't like his play style. I personally don't like carry junglers. I don't think that that's the best way to play the game. That's why I'm always hesitant on Bo. I think Bo is so good at the way he plays that it might be the excuse for, to play for the jungle. But very few times it works. Like you need the whole team to play like the way, for instance, yes. MDK is doing. It's like yes. everybody goes with Elioia. Yeah. For this reason, I think that it's a lose-lose situation because Mad looks dog water. And Markun, for instance, if I take him as an example, looks bad I, 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 and... I think it's better for Markun to play in the era. I think it's better to be in the LFL right now and be one of the top junglers in the LFL and be like, oh, why is Markun playing in the LFL? He should be in the right. LEC next year instead of being, oh, this guy is washed up. Because your career is very short now. If 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 you're in the position of Markun, the position, for instance, I was speaking <coughs> recently with VTO. If VTO didn't find Team Heretics last year, I think people would have said, he's cooked. He's good, he's yeah, good for would. the era. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's over. It's like Aka. It's like, he's not good anymore. Like, guys, just move on. You know, we're going to just find a new... So, because you have so few years in the LEC, you should not sign on the paper if you don't 100% think you can, you're can you going to be able to express yourself from a player. And that just relates to your point, which is, you were the person still signing your name at the bottom of the paper at the end of the day. And you should heavily uh, insist on that. Just not ask about the, the term and the price, but as well who you're playing with, who's going to coach you, what are the objectives of the team, what is the culture of the team? Because this is going to take you places eventually. Right. The next team on my list was SK, and then you had them one highest. You had them fifth, and I had them sixth. We nailed this one. I mean, I look, right. obviously the joke is we didn't know the teams above and below. But the reason why I actually think we did nail this one is if people don't remember, we actually were quite positive about this roster. Like, we we did praise the fact it looks like a good min-max roster. We've taken some gambles in the right spots. You've also signed some good players as well. Like you got Niski, etc. But you kept irrelevant. By the way, that part might be the most underrated part of all. This guy looked fucking monstrous this split. So I actually think if you look at this team, 
It's even perfect because this is one of the few teams that did follow my model of what I expected. Here's the difference. Even if people like Mad Lions somehow walked on water and never got worse when the pressure hit, people like Isma did get affected by the pressure. Mate. Once the get, matches got bigger and bigger and it got later in the season, this team just sort of gradually fell apart a bit. But I tell you what, the first part looked good and they did show some promise. There was a world where they could have maybe stolen a spot higher or two, you know, so I actually still feel like it's a good team. I, just, I think their problem just was they couldn't do some of the things they did in the first weeks were like really exciting and then they couldn't necessarily hold it together as much for me. Where are you at on the SK? They, I think they started with their identity. The problem is always the same thing. You, you play things in December and early January that define what you're good at because you don't know what's good. And I think when they realized that the meta was, might be a little bit slower than what they expected, they stopped playing this, oh, we're going to win bot lane and win the game, which was their play style. And, or they had a hard time just playing it because it was not the, like playing early was not as easy, I think, in this split. Even if you look at the finals, right, MDK is playing very early, but you can get caught up at some point, especially against good teams. Um, I think SK is, uh, is at a pretty sweet point because they've shown that if the meta is early, um, they are able to get a lot of wins. The hurdle they have to overcome now is if the meta is not early, maybe irrelevant is more of a win condition and they probably need to diversify Keep this style, like probably in scrims. If I if I were if I was the coach of SK, I would say probably our scrim distribution. If we have six games a day, I'm gonna spend four or five games working on our play style, which is really snowballed through the bot lane. But one game a day, I would be like, okay, guys, we're just gonna do this exercise of like leaving the bot lane alone and trying to send jungle support on the top side of the map in a way that we can see if it works for us because. Teams might be thrown off in drafts if we keep last pick for irrelevant and give him a heavy carry and we can win game through that, then it becomes much harder because we're going to unlock a lot of bans. The problem that they have is these teams are usually pretty easy to prep against because you know that if Exaki can does don't get a counter pick or if Niski doesn't have a pick that can move, you're just going to wait for 15-20 minutes with an Azir and a, and a, and a Xayah and you're not going to win the game against them. So the good thing for, uh, uh, for SK is the fact that, as you said, Irrelevant shows way more than what uh, was promised. It's yeah. like, he's over-delivering by, like, landslide. It's it's amazing what he's doing right now. And not only on tanks, but on carries. Yes. So I'd say there is a lot of work to do for this SK team in terms of consistency. But at least, unlike Rogue, the, the work is laid out. They, they have a starting point. They have things to leverage on. They have players. The team is very coherent. You see that they want to play with each other. There is no no breaking point where the team just broke mentally or things like this. No drama at all. So all the indicators show that SK will, for the whole year, be at least a decent team. Uh, in my book, at least that's the case. By the way, I'm definitely with you on the angle about playing to certain lanes and away from one. Because look, first of all, if you have Exekick, you're obviously going to play a bunch of your games towards him. That's the point of having that player and bringing that whole bot lane. But I'm with you. The problem here is I can tell who's only watching. Like, look, I get it if people don't watch every SK game, they're not like the biggest name, etc. But I can tell who's going off old narratives. Because the problem is, if you're going off the original, like first set of narratives for Irrelevant, you don't know the player. Like, the guy who first came in when he's back on Misfits, he was just the guy who was the weak sider and he would probably play like fucking Scion or something stupid like that or, or Nara Raw or something. And he was job really was like, he's never ever going to be played to because he's the top player. Like the job on those teams was like, get Vithio ahead, let Neon doing the team fight and peel for him. As you've seen, he gradually last year then started flexing. Hit, if people don't know, you're already in Solo Q, he was always playing Jax. He started to get his, the odd Jax game, but you could tell it was like they just picked the drafts where they could give him it, you know, and then he had a good... Now, like you see, he's actually really good even on the carries, guys. Like, you can give this guy, like, the fucking Rumble or a Renekton or a Jax again, like, and he could just straight up carry, but the problem now becomes there's no point having him weak side of doing that all the time. You've got to give him the odd game, like you say, where you actually give him a chance to really carry, because there's the other thing, mate. I know the joke is, because he's German, you'll think, like, it's that classic against the meme of like German officials. The guy was really efficiently good though. Like it wasn't like a flash in the pan. He looked like consistently good. Like, they, like I say, this is a player where 
I was thinking to myself, like, wow, how do you get Niski? Oh, it is much better than... Mate, Irrelevant has actually shown, unironically, to, he might be the best top player. Like, he's right up there with Adam and, and BB. Like, he's really good. So if you're SK, three. this is what you call, like, found money. You didn't even expect this. You just found a pile of money on the floor. Pick it up. Invest in it. Like, because I'm with you. This could, instead of being one-dimensional like they were the first few weeks, you could actually have a diversity of styles in this team and win a bunch of ways. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the only problem is throughout the process of uh, playing through the top side, I had I faced this very specifically. I had Dokla in my team, and I was able to give him counter picks in screams. The problem is when you're ahead as a top laner, you, you, you still have to not be with your team, meaning that most of your resources are allocated somewhere else on the map. So the, the four people that are not with the top laner, who's the person ahead, needs to respect the options of the enemy foreman. Because usually what happens if you play through topside, it means that the enemy bot lane is a little bit more ahead. So your foreman is usually weaker than their foreman, right? Yes. From the game theory perspective. So that triggers a system where the guys that are usually ahead needs to not press that button and wait for the guy who's actually ahead to move on the map and trigger a play. My team, for instance, I had a bunch of impatient guys on the four-man, and I'm pretty sure Niski, uh, Dos, and Exakik are probably the, the sure. same thing. And Dokla was a little young in his career, so he didn't have all the knowledge to know when to move, what to say. And so that creates... This is a whole branch of, of team play that you might not have, right? You Like, in Chinese teams, you don't know how much, like, Chinese top speak. But I'm pretty sure they're vocal all the time. It's like, guys, I'm going to trade him on this wave. Come, come, jungle, don't go mid. Just come. We're going to 2v2 bot lane in, at 25, 35 minutes. You see these 2v2s randomly happening to death because they're sure they're going to kill. Or they're like, okay, guys, I'm, I'm going to get this wave in. I'm going to go through their vision. I'm going to go and, and flank them on the mid wave. If you don't make that call, it's completely useless to give you resources in the early game. And if you don't know how to do that, it takes some time to learn. So... SK can, but that's why I'm saying your allocation should be 5-1 or like a, a, a little because it, it takes a lot of time and, and you might waste your identity through trying to learn that during a season. But that's definitely for me the, um, the saving grace because if they didn't have irrelevant playing carries, I would be a little bit worried for their year. Right, the next one, I actually had Fnatic all the way down at five. You had him third, so you actually almost got it there. You got you got pretty well. You did think they'd be one of the stronger teams. By the way, I also do think there's a world where they easily could have been third or second. I think if you saw the playoff series went. Right, what was the good and bad of this team? Because the funny thing is, like a lot of Fnatic rosters over the years, this isn't a team where it's like, even though we're saying like third or fourth, they were pretty good. There's clearly like strengths, but also big flaws. So what do you think of Fnatic this split? I have a very hard time being saying nice things about Fnatic all the time because I feel like an org that has such an attraction towards player with its name, like it's not very hard to convince player to play for Fnatic guys. Yes. Like, plot twist, if you're historically a popular team and you have a huge fan base, players are going to be more eager to play for you. Um, so I think with the attraction they have, I think it the coherence of their roster is always always surprising. Like it, it doesn't feel like they're playing as a five man. They just have exceptional players. Like if Humanoid decides to play the game, you see that this guy is just a gem, right? Like since he starts, he went to Worlds pretty much every single year, had always good showings when he needs to. Do you you know that this guy is good at the game? Uh Razork is to me the best jungler. Uh and you saw his match against Elioya. Like Elioya even said he got clapped because I mean Razork is just at the prime, like he's at, in, in your career, you never know when your prime is, but all the might, I'm telling you guys, this is the prime time of Razor. Like this guy is playing amazing League of Legends. And I'm so sad th that there is not a, like a, a good jungle support mid that happens to take over games. I'm, I'm so sad that there is no like good systems of flank and position and vision in team fights that will allow them to actually destroy teams like BDS with the caliber of players they have. I'm very sad that they... Oscar Inin is performing poorly because uh, Fnatic being anything but close second to G2 is an absolute failure to me. That's that's where I... I if, if you really this team that has a name that attracts the best players and you're able to get them and you have that many options during the offseason and you're not even uh, tied to like be the best team in your region because G2 is already taking it, at least be second. That's the only thing I'm asking to Fnatic. I want Fnatic to be second, because if it's not the case, 
I mean, being fourth of what, what do you think? Being fourth of Fnatic for me it seems like being being kind of a failure. Put it this way: the only excuse I would give them is not even this year, mate. It's in past years when you had teams like Vitality were going for like super teams. Maybe then you can be third. But I'm with you. You are you actually the, one of the only teams like G2 that the joke is even if you didn't offer more money, someone might join just to be like, hey, dude, it's the org of like Expect here and Caps and Reckless and like that's the org you joined to become a legend. It's like it's like the obvious analogy right now of people know football would be look, Man United is not even close to the best, but they're still fucking Man United. Like think how many players must have grown up. With Worshiping that team, like as you say, that you have like a, essentially you have like an extra like added value in every negotiation, even if you don't put any more money on the table. So I'm with you. Like if essentially here's the problem. Even if I if I look at the game, they did all right, Fnatic. But if I look at like what the whole league is like, and especially if teams like Carbon Corp and Rex are going to shit the bed, you should be second place. I said, like, if I've said that thing about BDS before, you didn't get through the gate. That's the gate. If you'd have gotten through with this firepower, then I'd actually be excited, mate, because that's the saddest thing for me about this team, is I actually do think some of these players are good players individually, but I'm with you. There are, there's no systems between them, though. Like, I'm with you on the Razark one. The joke is, until uh, the odd playoff game, he looked like he was actually the best jungler, mate. He was fucking smurfing, even though it's a bit of a broken team. Humanoid, look, my problem with him is still this, is he looks so good in the game, he turns up, you Ignore the two where he doesn't, or the one where he just sort of goes meh, and then he has the one route game that's so crazy on the car. He was like, oh my god, it's human! But then we all forget when he has the one that isn't. But to, not that many players can have the one game like that, so it's why it's addictive. It's why he's the ultimate gamble, right? It's hard to kick a player like that. Then the problem I have on the Oscar and him, well, this is why actually for Fnatic, I'm a bit worried about the future split mates. Is I'll just say it right now. The Oscarian guy never came back from that hand injury. You know what I mean? Like, he had some games that were good, but he has some towards the end. That he was looking bad towards the end, right? He was one of the players that was kind of underwhelming me. And then I'll have to just say on the Jun guy, this plays right into what you said earlier about the peach angle. Look, I don't have any problems with him. He's not some shit player. But what was, the, again, if I took the nameplate and the flag off, would I know this was an imported Korean player? Like, is this called JJ? Are we going to fucking be an MSI for? Are we? No, we're not. It's just like, there's, again, I've, I don't know who it would be. Assume it's not Jimby, who's now in heretics, but there's got to be an ERL player who could have gone in support, you know, here, surely. It's like, I think as a region, we, and and I I, I phrased that on a tweet saying that the thing I'm the most uh, agree against, uh, angry about in the whole Western League is the fact that LFL has 20% of old LEC players. 20%. Oh, One right. player out of five is an old LEC player. Okay. I, I've made the count, like I've checked who has already played. Right. There's 20%. This is this is critical, man. Because if if you think about the fact that, for instance, all most uh, valued ERL, which is probably the LFN, maybe there is a discussion oh, easy, about yeah. LTP and stuff, right? Uh, um, has twenty percent of players that know we know already their face value when they are playing on the on the big stage, and most of them already played and will probably never play. And we are taking slots from the LEC and give them to players that probably at some point in their life with very legitimate choice or return to their country to live their life yeah, because obviously. I'm not going to spend 20 years in, in, in Europe. It's like, are not, aren't we set up, uh, set up ourselves for failure by having so many slots taken and not trying to make this... The best way to improve is still to, con to confront yourself to harder experience of the game, right? Yes. So if you take a guy in Division 2 and you make him play in LFL, he might look shit in LFL for a split or two, but Irrelevant looked horrendous when he arrived in the ELC. He looked horrendous. He was absolutely horrible. Oh, yeah, actually, horrific. if people don't remember, because his name was irrelevant, he even got memed. People were like, lol, why named that? Like, yeah, true, he was flamed the first place. Yeah. It was really, really bad. Yes. No, he's one of the best. BB yes. wasn't as great. He was in TSM and he wasn't playing the way he plays right now. No, he's a, he's a Western yep. reference, but it hasn't been the case every single time. So there is definitely a curve of improvement. And we've seen multiple times that there is a, a field of opportunity when we put players outside of their comfort zone into, into uh, higher stake matches. The fact that we are taking spots from people like Trimby in the ERDC to get Korean players that probably weren't going to sell back or they're going to leave in two years. And that the fact that <coughs> we are taking spots in the RLs for these replacements uh, by players that go down from the ERDC makes me extremely worried because you speak about outside of Trimby, who would you take? Do you have a name? Like out of my mind, out of on the top of my head, I don't have no, one no. support name like, oh, this guy... I have one for Jungle. I have one for ADC. Kelly's from KC is probably the next big thing in the ADC. But for support, we don't. So we should keep looking. Instead of going for the safe bets or for the Korean, we should keep looking and keep digging until we find the gem, the guy that is 
probably not showing yet that he is able to play in LEC, but if you put him in LFL now, in one year and a half, you'll know. But but we won't know because we have players from an old age playing in the ARLs and we have Koreans in the LEC. So that's what I'm upset about. As per Fnatic, uh, I agree with you. I think they should change top. And Oskarin should take a split at a lower stake in a way that he can fully recover mentally and in the game because he, he doesn't have the level to play in LEC right now. Yes, which is sad because it's not a player I have anything against. And obviously last year he was sort of peaking. He was looking better and better each split. So it's just one of those times where it just doesn't work out for whatever reason. It's very unlucky. Yeah. And, I, and here's the other problem I will say as well is I don't think it's harsh for someone like Fnatic in light of our conversation to remove a player like that. Like again, here's the thing. That player, maybe I keep them gamble if I am a rogue or a giant. And maybe I keep him around and he gets good next player. If I'm Fnatic, I'm sorry. I actually do need to, I need to win now. Like I want to, I want to be fucking contesting G2 for the time. I want to be at MSI. I want to be at World. So Actually, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. That's the obvious move for me. It's just you get a better top player there. And then you hope... And that's the moment you get the Korean. Because you are you know that the, the ERL system and the LEC system don't align. Calendars are not the same. So the season sure. windows are not the same. You might end up with a top laner that comes from Division 2 or that's like definitely not better than Oscar. So you want to definitely an upgrade on the short term. So you sign a Korean top laner. For, but no, you already use your two import slots. So you can't. Yes. That's unfortunate. What if you had Trimby and Noah and you could just get like someone that's very good from, from Asia to save your year? Probably not this year, man. I will say as well, I also prefer that gamble. Because here's the other thing. If you're going to bring in some like not famous Korean support player, it's like, mate, you're already already making his job so hard. Because first of all, I mean, at least Noah is Korean. So he gets, John gets to play with a Korean bot. Some of the other ones are just going to play with the Westerner who has totally different culture, vision of the game, background. And also the Korean angle means they probably can't talk as much. They can't do shot call in the same way. Like, there's so many factors. The difference is, if anyone watches LCK, like spoiler, if you go and watch certain teams like D Plus and KT, they have actually like top lanes you've never heard of who were actually really good. Like, that, like those guys, you could throw them in probably an LEC team because it's top lane. The joke is you play on your own after the fucking game anyway. They actually probably would smurf and, and smash a bunch of lanes. So, and with you, if you were going to gamble, that's the moment you gamble. Yeah, you don't do it at the beginning of the split and then bring a guy who's a nobody. Now, as well as the 777 promotion I told you about on this episode, you can also do another promotion, which again, isn't a first time one. Everyone could do it. They can just only do it once. And this is to celebrate the Lunar New Year that happens in Asia where they have the festivals, etc. They're doing an esports bet, a challenge. Chinese New Year Red Envelope Frenzy. So again, you go on the main page, you go to promotion here. It's going to be this first one on the top left, Red Envelope Frenzy. It's got 34 more days at the time of recording, so you've still got over a month, plenty of time to activate. You can only do it once, but everyone can do this one once. And I think this one is actually one of the best promotions that they've actually ever run in terms of what you can get for it. Because again, make sure you go over here, you select the right thing, apply it all, etc. This is how this one works. It's for a limited time only, like I say, if you deposit 100 USDT, you will receive an additional 100 USDT. So you'll get 100% match in that sense. You'll get 100,000 ESC, their esports coin, their own token, which you can make bets and bricks with and convert into USDT. Check out other promotions for that or ask customer support. And you will also receive a one risk-free bonus quarter on any League of Legends spring tier one game. In other words, a risk-free bet. That one has to be your first one. So make sure you understand the terms and conditions. But essentially, you can do a bet on a a tier one game. So that has to be within the LCK, the LPL, LEC is finished now, but you can also wait till it begins again. LCS and PCS spring season, if you're at that point in time, you're watching over in that region. So this is actually one of our absolute best ones. Everyone could do it once, but you can only do it once. Make sure you get in under the time window. Right. What about this then? Then I had, we actually, it's one of the only positions we both had the same. We both had Vitality in fourth. That we... Oh, we pretty much killed that one. That's pretty good. Because the only problem is this, though, Zabatine. The problem I have with Vitality is this. I will say I did put a lot of my faith in this roster. Actually, I outsourced it from the team to the coach. I was like... Always remember, guys, this is a Mac project, so I can't just look at these in isolation. Now, here's the problem. I even said this before, right? The problem is this. When Mac takes the broken players and he like, you know, like a little baby bird with a broken wing and he just comes and instead of like a cynical coach, you know, they just go get another bird, get, get rid of that bird, it's injured. He takes it in then and get, he feeds it the milk. Come on. And he puts a little blanket around it. And he nurses them back to health and then he gives them, the, you know, the courage they need to push them finally out the nest so they can fly. Right, that's beautiful when he takes those players 
that everyone thinks on other teams. They're not that good. And he finds out the play. The downside is this, though. He told me this in my interview with him. He's the guy who he won't tell you in a scrim. Like, you went, like don't do that. Because he doesn't like, that's not his way of, like, teaching people. His style's more like, it's like Socrates. You keep asking them questions until they figure it out themselves, right? And he also has sort of a creative mindset to not be reductive. He's not going to take, like, here's the joke. Someone like Mac probably would have got way more out of irrelevant way earlier. Other people did just go, well, you know what? You're doing an all right job as a weak sider. Pick Nar and Sion and shut the fuck up. Right, drop playing taken care of. No, no. He would have sort of been like, oh, and, oh, you have this Jax? Well, let me see. Can I enable that? What draft could I? He actually would do what you said earlier, basically. So the problem I have is this. I do think he is the, probably one of the only coaches who, in English, we would say, would give as, as much rope as possible to Hillisang, which Hillisang would then hang himself with in this metaphor because unfortunately like I think almost any other coach would have come in and be like Hillisang shut it down pal this is going really badly but mate they were willing to ride that horse till the very end of this split like they gave this guy the green light to do those engage angles even when he might have had like a 0-8 game the last game they just still let him do it so even though part of me loves that when it works when it doesn't it can look really bad so funny thing is they still end up with an alright placing but man this team didn't get its potential like for me there were so many parts that were, like, were kind of messy. It was just a, it was a, it was a strange team. Where are you at on vitality? I mean, I'm disappointed. Like everyone who thought this team could be very good early in the year, I as I'm like you, you know, it's a Mac project, so you know this team is gonna improve. It's like striker, you yes. know, good coaches make that, do that. This team's gonna improve. I think that vitality. They have a really good prospect. I was thinking about Super. They have Stan. It's a French Super that plays in Vitality B. Uh, I think this guy is very well spoken about. I haven't watched LFL this year. I, okay. I try to watch less league and, and watch other esports. Uh, that's the choice I made. So I, I kind of cater to LEC. Um, but apparently this guy is probably, if, if, if the project is a long-term project for Vitality, which sounds weird, Vitality long-term project, but... Let's assume it's a long term project. Sure. There is probably a transition between, you know, trying to find a new gem in, in the RLs, uh, uh, raise them with the vitality culture in the academy, and then transfer them <coughs> when Hilly Sang just, you know, retires or something. As per this year, I'd say it is very hard to bet against Hilly Sang because even though we say that, he still goes to Wells. Like, that's like humanoid. It's so horrific to sure. because we as content creators, right? We have to speak about what happened recently. Yes, we go week so, to week, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So you, you, uh, if you ask me right now, I would say, yeah, just give the this guy needs to retire, and okay. then he's gonna make like this recan engage in semifinals in summer split playoffs. Okay. That's gonna take. Uh, that's gonna take vitality to world. So here, I've like, got the analogy for you. Back. Here's the analogy for you. Basically, if you were someone who was doing what people claim you're supposed to do with crypto, you pick the one you like and you hodl. You just go, hey, I'm not going to touch it. For a year, I'm going to see what it is. If you did that, Hillisang would be a perfect player because as you say, it doesn't matter that, you know, if you check the graphs, you'd be scared some days. He gets there in the end. As long as he gets there in the end, it's okay. The problem we have is this. You're right. Especially if you do shows like this. This is like being a day trader. If someone's down now, I'm supposed to sell now in case he's down in a week and I'm supposed to buy the hot guy who's hot. But the problem, I know what you mean. The real problem with this is, it's what actually, even the joke is, even Fnatic have had to learn this hard way. You kick Hillisang when he's at his worst and you're like, phew, finally I got rid of him. And then he goes and fucking wins the title of Mad Lions. You're like, what the hell? Like, why did we get rid of this guy? But then he comes back and he's bad again. So you're like, which is it? Is he bad? Is he good? So essentially you'd, you'd stick with him. You'd gamble again. I mean, I, I'm happy I don't have, I'm not the one who has <laughs> It's good you're not actually choice. the one who has to I'm very live with the consequences. To be on the content creator side now, <laughs> you know, true. that's that's part of retirement. Yes, that's a good part of retirement as a coach. Yes. I'd say I trust, I trust the players that are in this team. The only one that I'm not really keen on is Photon, because once again, for the same reasons, like there is no exceptions to me. It's like, I don't think he's providing enough to, uh, I, I, I wish they had Irrelevant. I think Irrelevant would do amazing in this team. Yes. Uh, because I think Photon only plays carries and that's, absolutely terrible for the system of Vitality, who has two very good carries that would definitely use a little bit more space in their yes. team fights. Yes. Um, for the Ili Seng thing, um, I think this uh, year for support is a little bit harder because the pool has never been that wide. I think Ili Seng has shown very good performance on years where it was Tamkenj versus Bomb 90% oh, sure. of the game. You know, it was a very low skill role. No, you have the Bards, you have the <coughs> Zyras, you have the Ashes, the Caitlyn's, the Kalista. Like, you know that 
the pool is, is almost infinite in support. And I don't think it's the play style of Healy. And I think they should go for something that's a little bit more simple for him. But I'm not going to discard the guy. Like, if at the end of the year, he had, didn't have any showing, please invite me next year and say, okay, it's the whole. Sure. It's finally the year where Healy Sang was a no sure. on a whole year. But so far, since 2015, every single year, there has been a point where we say, this guy is gone. Sure. Like, this guy is done. Like, where sure. every single year. And then, and then he comes back. So... I'm going to I'm going to uh, suspend my judgment. The only thing I would say is Vitality is one of the most disappointing teams in this in this split because we haven't seen Vitality. I can tell you Rogue is shit. I can tell you Heretics probably not going to improve very well. Maybe with Twin it's going to be better. Um I can tell you that G2 is probably going to be the best team for the whole year. I have I can't say anything about Vitality. They didn't play. They 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 were 19 playing this split. And we'll see for the next one. And that's that's kind of frustrating to have a team that's like right in the middle of the standings. You don't know what they done. Like, yes. what is Vitality playstyle? Nobody knows. By the way, I do like the disclaimer that you're not the one who actually has to make this decision. Because to be fair, I would say the same thing about Perks, right? Which is even when, like, Prince, this was his most ass split I think I've ever seen. But the joke is when people are like, well, then say to fire him for and get rid of him. It's like, yeah, but the problem is I, I, I don't actually, like, I'm, I don't get fired. I'm not actually the coach of uh, that team. So the joke is, like, I just want to see Perks play again. So I don't give a fuck. Like, <laughs> essentially, I could just be BM and go... Yeah, Peter, do it again. By the way, spoiler, no one listens to this show and fucking make the teams on what I say. If you do that, you probably should be fired immediately. Like, I hope there's more due diligence to watching talk shows and reading Reddit, even though I'm not sure for certain GMs over the years, but we'll pretend there is. So, yeah, I agree with that one. And then the other thing I would say on this one is... Um, this, uh, here's where I, this is where you know I've actually changed my mind on certain players. Because, bro, I can't believe I'm about to say this sentence out loud. For a team that didn't live up to its potential, like we're talking about, didn't even look like the system worked. Actually, they had a lot of problems even getting like the comps online and making them work. That's why actually they got flamed on the draft. I, think. I don't even think the draft was terrible. I think what happened is you just in the end, like you say, were fought on. You had three people who wanted to carry the game and have like their strong champions. That doesn't work. And so the joke is the one person I put no blame on in this team at all, I, even though I used to flame him, I think Kazi is actually just really good, mate. His problem is, like you said about him, not, the upset ones are not quite as good. He didn't play as well, but Kazi actually even played well. They just couldn't do anything there. Like, like it's like, Guys, until like later in the split, it wasn't even the champions where he could have done something. Like, and then also he just had there was his his support was literally just dying all the time. Like, what do you? Everyone's it's played solo cool. queue. Even if you've been auto filled, you can't win if the support just dies all the time. Come on, it's not possible. I mean, Kelsey, Kelsey did what he did his job. That's I, I mean, that's how he felt about uh, vitality, and I think that's probably the feeling of most people, uh, even even amateurs that watched it at home. It's like vitality. It's like yeah, he listened when he was zero zero zero. They looked to be a pretty good team that might actually beat the top teams in team fights. That's it. So yeah, if Hilly Sang is not 0 7 0, maybe we can like draw conclusions. But yes. no, you look at the amount of games that have been played because of the crappy format, and you end up oh, they played like what seven games. Like they played nine games and then they played what one B of three, two B of threes, two B of threes or something, yeah, or maybe two B three. of threes, right? So, so they played two, I think it was two zero two zero, right? So they played four and nine. They played thirteen games. What do you want me to draw? What, what conclusion should I draw from that? Like there are teams where I clearly showed like patterns in thirteen games. There are teams where, for instance, it's very hard to say for Rogue and KC because we have seen pretty much nothing of them. It's B O one. Uh, but for, for Vitality, it's a team with the caliber of the players they have. 13 games, including 9 BO1s, is not enough to draw, to draw a conclusion. So I'll suspend my judgment. Uh, I'll be very happy to be much more assertive in uh, after the spring split. Yes. And I'll also just throw this out there. Guys, if you look at the two teams that eliminated them in the playoffs... It was BDS and Mad Lions who actually play like a team. So I think, if anything, that shows you if your vitality, what your flaw was. You might have had better players at positions, but they were better teams than you and they could actually play as a team. Whereas vitality, I mean, this is why at this point in time, in general, I always say like curses don't really exist except in your mind, right? But obviously, if they do exist in your mind, they can be very real. The joke is, right? Everyone always said every year, like vitality's just cursed. But I kept saying, like, yeah, but they're changing all the players. Like, the joke is, this almost makes you feel like they are. Like, every vitality life just never works out so well. So, well, We'll see. We'll see for the future. Time with you. I do actually give this one a bit of space. I still think this could make... There's so many improvements you could make to this squad. Even with these five players, that I think you could just be better. Obviously, like you say, if you could swap the top player out, we could cook immediately. If you can give me like a proper top player that'll fit this team. Like the joke on this one is, again, if we're doing trades, 
If we're doing trades, Zabatin, should I tell you a trade right now you could do, assuming they all get their shit together in the oh, better no. team? Or, I was going to say, or do I'm there for Photon, Giant X and Vitality, it would fix both your team. Both your teams. Do that trade tomorrow. And by the way, the, I'll tell you who's going to be super happy the first day Odo Abney walks in. Vethion fucking Kazi. Like, welcome to the team fight, boys. Now you can play the team fight. Welcome to the team fight. So imagine <laughs> your, your video and Kazi, like, he these things like, um, pick me a list star. You're like, oh, okay. And then you hear the other players like, mm, you know, with his accent, it's like, I think it's a good, it's a good silent game here. And you're like, yes, oh. the dream. <laughs> Guys, the dream. Guys, we have Alistair at home. We can play the game. Yes, exactly. Incredible. Exactly. Instead of having guys like, yeah, I think Yasio top looks really good here. Oh, okay, okay. Pick Yasio, you know, and especially yes. with the system, like as you said, Mac is the kind of guy that's like, if you if you believe in your dream, like he's going to go, go guy, just just take the champion you think is going to be good here. And and you're like, I'm pretty sure like your video calls you and you're like, okay, I think here we need some front lane and you're here. Mm, I'm going to go Gwen. <laughs> You know, like, yeah, my champion's not really good with a Gwen top. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I understand. I, I, I wish there were trades, uh, yes. but for now, it's not it's not the case. So we'll see. But this Vitality team has too much good material, whether it's in the staff or in the team, to discard, discard them for the rest of the year. Yes. And then now we get into the area that I call Top Keck. Because, spoiler... My next two teams was Carmen Cork and Heretics is my third and second team, right? You had, obviously, Heretics was way low. You had them at, I think, sixth. But you had Carmen Cork yourself at second. So we were both super high on Carmen Cork. So let's talk about it, right? Look, I'll just start and say, I'll open the table by saying this. I'd say fair play if people told me. You were wrong, but it's like, you know, I pick, pick one player. Say it was like that I thought Sacken would be good and he was kind of a bit shit and didn't do that. No, no, like... Basically, every player except Bo somewhat disappointed me, and it's more on upsets. Like I said, more of his. Like, like if you knew this was the lineup, why did you walk into it? That's what I'd say to upset. But then, even then, by the way, I've heard they were good mm -hmm. in scrims. So, like, I have, ne I've almost, I've almost never seen a team completely collapse like this. Minute, where almost everyone ends up looking worse. I mean, the joke is to a casual, even Bo looked worse, but because of the nature that he's playing aggressive jungler. So his problem was he was going in, and then people left him, and they were like, "Why did he hit?" It's like if they actually followed up, that was a good engage. You know, like, what do you think of this team? Because I feel like this is the one where. Unfortunately, almost everything we're going to say is going to seem negative. Um, I'd say the first thing I'd say is for second, there is a point where your the 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 retirement door is very close to you when you're a player, and if if it's the case that it's your time, you should at least leave on a good showing. So I don't know because second has a very complex career where he didn't play on a fair. I don't think the vitality did him good. In terms of putting him... If people don't remember, the Vitality he played in was the one where they had, like, if, first of all, they were supposed to have the Milicia guy, and then they had, like, changed out the jungler. It was never the same lineup. Like, and the bot lane was a nightmare. No, it, was, it, was, it was a terrible team, that one. It was a terrible team. Um, so, so and then and then I think he thought, like, LEC was not available for him anymore, then moved to Carmine, Carmin, had a phenomenal year in 2020. I think at this time, he should have looked for opportunities in the LEC and left right. KC because... And I think one of the things that actually hindered him a lot uh, from at least, uh, I would say, a coach that worked specifically on mid lane for multiple years now, I think that when you're a, a mid laner, uh, there is a lot of added uh, external pressure when you play on LEC because jungle support are way more keen on pressuring mid in, in LEC and even more at Worlds. And so staying in the LFL as... Uh, hindered his development because I think that he was at his prime in 2020 and he would have had included a lot of the pacing, uh, integrated a lot of pacing of the games in LEC earlier in his career. But know that he spent two more years kind of slumping in a league where he's way better. No doing, the, you know, when when you, you didn't gym for two years, going back to the gym feels much, sure. much harder. Sure. And and I think that really putting back, you know, the, the this level of training is very hard for a player that even stated openly that his motivation was was dropping because he was still playing in the era last year. The problem is you can't just <coughs> flip a switch and come back. And so no, you see that he's not at his prime. He's doubting himself, and he's probably even more pressured because he knows that he's kind of old, and the retirement might happen eventually if he doesn't play from well. The only advice I have for these players is you might you might at least you know leave on a, on a, on a good performance. So give it your all because. Saken has been the most underperforming player in this team by 
far yes. in comparison. I do not like you have to be homogeneous with your judgment. There is no world where this Mad Lions team, Koi team players are amazing in the LEC and they were all outclassed by the Carmine Corp last year. Yep. That, that doesn't work. Like yes. you don't suddenly become terrible at the game and the other guys are like just a runner up against G2 at the same split. So it means that Saken is actually heavily underperforming individually. That's a critical problem that I think hasn't been addressed because he's a fan favorite, especially in France. But the, yep. play, the player that has been the most <coughs> underwhelming for me by far has been taken. And I think it's a combination of slumping, going back at it, uh, the, the stress and the pressure of under-delivering and the, the threat of retirement, right? Getting benched before showing yourself, that kind of like hinder him. And, and, and on his side, you have Bo, this young prodigy that just wants to play as aggro as he can, the Mad Lion side. And if... You take the Mad Lion playstyle and you just replace the Mad Lion player by KC players. This team is actually better than Mad Lions. Probably, I would say I'm pretty certain they would be better. But the problem is to reach that, you need the level of trust in yourself that they don't have because the trajectories of every single player in this Carmine Corp is very weird, man. You look at Kabosha, you look at Seiken, you look at Bo, you look at Upsets, you look at Targamas. All these guys had high highs and very low lows in their careers, meaning that they are not players that fit in any system. And I think that I really thought that the glue in this whole system was Yamato. And when I saw their performance and I saw no, the draft weren't bad, but I think that didn't reflect the very nature of what Carmen Cobb was able to do in my book. And then they fired him and I was like, they don't know what they're doing. And that's the problem I have. This is the first time. There is two times where Carmine uh, failed to resist the song of the sirens. You say sirens yeah, yeah. or do you say mermaids? Sirens. Mermaid song. Uh, you say sirens, yeah, okay. Um, because, you know, remember last year when they did the skins and Saken and they got Kauri from uh, Evil Geniuses? Yes. It always looks good on the paper. That's the songs of sirens. You need to resist that urge to pick the player that you think is going to be the best and go with something you know is going to work for sure because your life is on the line. And here, I think they went for a play four hour, very good players, but that had high highs and low lows. And the problem is in this system, <coughs> apparently Yamato wasn't the glue, so they're all showing out their lows. So there is a lot to change for this Carmine Corp, but there is still, unlike Rogue, there is a lot of uh, raw material to, to, to develop on. It's just finding a system to align bow and upset, which both require the presence of the support next to them, is one of the trickiest things to build in League of Legends as a coach. And the fact that they fire the head coach sh shows that nobody, it feels like nobody has a, a, an idea of what's going on. Yeah, what I would say is, like, I'll start on the second point, actually. This is where I actually hate when narratives, like you you nailed it there. When you actually have like analytical lenses and principles, you have to apply them equally to everyone. Like you can't say essentially, like I'm going to use logic type a to judge Carmine Corp. But then when I judge uh, Mad Lions, I'll use logic type B, which might even be anti A. That doesn't make sense. Like, you got to be fair because here's why narratives get really messed up. So people are going to tell me because Mad Lions was good, see, that's what happens when you take like an ERL core together and then you bring them up and then you give them comfort. Well, as Zabatine pointed out, Carmine Corp had an ERL core. By the way, they played Mad Lions and fucking beat them in the EU Masters, which is... Guys, you don't have to watch the fucking ERLs, but at least watch the EU Masters finals, please. Because there's the other thing. When people tell me about Saken, right, and go see, he wasn't LEC quality. It's like, it's like you said, he might have had the odd year that wasn't as good, but like he always looked like a top, a top player in the LFLs. And especially, this is the worst thing. Again, this is a rare case where I... You know, normally it's really dodgy to label a player a choker because you don't really know. Like, was it like calm issues? Was this maybe they had a personal issue with the player or the coach didn't vibe? This is a player where I am almost certain I can tell you he had nerve issues because, bro, the second that played in the RLs, it's not just that the other players weren't as good. He would do moves that he just never made in the LEC. I've, he was in the the term you say in English is he was he was tr like gun shy. He couldn't pull the trigger. He would literally go in and at a moment when any even in random solo queue was here presses R, he wouldn't press R. Like the joke almost was because at the same time as the Iron Wolf story, the joke is like if if I didn't know he actually 
she was just playing back. It looked almost like match fixing. Like it looked like, what the hell are you doing? Like you're just stood there not doing any spells. Like what? What? This isn't what Azir does. Like and so, by the way, if people don't know, Azir is his champion. That's like his fucking signature champion. So when he was having busted Azir games, I was like, oh my god, this is so bad. And then by the way, even when he tried to like spice it up and do that Akali game, oh, it was one of the worst Akali games I've seen in a long time. So like something happened, and it and, and I, I don't even blame that on Yamato or the other players on Ed Kami Cup. Something just happened to, specifically to him alone. Something happened to him, mate. I don't. And the problem, like you're saying, is, mate, they, unfortunately, he isn't the, the rookie where we can go, hey, give him a few more splits. He's already had years ago a bit of a scoff try, and then he's he's put so many years into now getting the big chance that, like, it's kind of, it is kind of like, it's it's Kami Corp or Bost if you're Saka. No one else is going to pick you up for LEC. So, like, you actually better make it work this way. I'm with you, though. Even, what you have to do, you've got the mindset nailed there, mate. Even if it actually goes shit next split and they really do fire you. Do something. Try and go out on a high. Essentially, go out, fire every shot out of the gun before you go is the scenario. It's like the cops are surrounding you in the scenario. They're going to come in with the SWAT team. You may as well fucking take every shot and hope you, hope you make it, you know. You may as well, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, you know, especially because I know he has it. Like, it's uh, it's it would be dumb for anyone who watched the ARLs the last years to say that Saiken is not able to play in in, in LEC. That's it, it's not the best. Like, I think that he's one of the most overrated players by its fan ever. Right? It's like XPK level of delusion. Right. Uh, on 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 what the fans thought Saiken was, but the realistic the, the real value of Saiken is still high. It's not as high as what fans thought, but it is high. It's just. As I said, it is very hard because I think there is a lot of uh, personal trajectories involved into a system that's very complex to make work. Like it's it's a very jungle ADC. How many teams has a good jungle and ADC at the same time? Like look, oh, it's if Peanut bad. was playing weak side in Gen G, Owner is playing is playing weak side for for T1. Like like teams that actually snowball through the jungle usually don't have a star a superstar ADC. Because it's so hard. You need the support to be at both sp places and the map at the same time. And so because of because of that, I mean, I once again, I feel like I'm going to say it because I, I haven't phrased my, my opinion on that, but I think that kind of did Yamato a little dirty. I think that's part of the, the esports routines. I think probably they clearly realized he wasn't the right fit and they were like, there is no real need to keep him uh, on board. And it's probably even was bring a negative because you know the German lower label, right? It's like yes. you still pay someone. So you, it means that they might have him, they might better pay him streaming at home than having on board. So there is there was something for sure that was clearly dysfunctional for them to move on with Rhea, who is not a random. Rhea was with Striker yeah, yeah. and Striker and, and, and he just he was there in every single iteration of Carmen Cup pretty much. Uh, I just I just hope for them that they did just a uh, bit more that they can, they, they can chew with this bow upset uh, roster. Here's the angle I want to ask you about Zabatine. Let me put this to yeah. you. Here's what's mad. Everyone's going to think we've lost our mind if they're casual fans, especially if they've never watched the LFL, by what I'm about to propose to you. But the joke is, look, the only player, like the two players that are the most obvious ones to remove is obviously mid and support, right? It's very likely you're going to do both either, right? But my biggest problem goes like this. If even though people know, well, they'll say I'm biased for born upset. The re the thing that kills me is this: I actually think that not only are those two really good players born upset, but even the way they play looks like it would be awesome if the others just did like a basic job. They don't even have to be good. Like, here's the saddest thing. If I'm going to have a carry jungler and a fucking stud ADC who wants to win team fights, half of the guy who's in his aim is perfect. And if he doesn't want to be the star, you don't have to be bro. Just, just fucking lay an okay, get to the team fight, press R, fucking use the sand soldiers to zone people off and then let Bo go in, follow up, let upset fucking kite everyone. The problem they have is the other players almost neutralize the actual strength you have. Like, I feel like if you could put the right players on those guys, because I'm with you on what you said earlier before everyone keeps saying right here's the difference i've admitted it before i'm just i am a fucking homer for perks i'm just riding with him because fuck it i want to see him play i don't care if he's bad right the difference is i will absolutely die on the hill that upset is still a really good player mate because i'm with you i saw those games and i was just thinking even from like a layman's perspective bro what if i pause any frame here what the fuck am i doing if i'm the adc there like like you say essentially there's times where people are going like he's not even going up and auto attacking it's like bro this 
this isn't season five. If he steps English one him, foot forward, he is going to have like two people go some mad angle on him and he will be dead in an instant. And that, by the way, then you'll just see he died in an instant. So like, he's actually in that scenario we see in England between a rock and a hard place. Like, he's stuck. There's nothing he can do. And remember, of all the fucking roles, your ADC, it's not the one that just 1v9s from minute one. It wouldn't have mattered if he was fucking ruler. He could not have, I don't think he could have won any of these games. He also didn't play awesome, but he never, he wasn't even in the games is my point. Yeah, I mean, and he was playing mostly Lucian, which is a champion that has a low range. Like, you, you can't, you can't, you, I, this is such a wrong way of analyzing. I think, well, we should, we should be past, like, I, I, I listen, I hear fans, right? I'm interacting with them. I have my channel and stuff. But I, I usually don't even respond. If, if, the, if the analysis is so narrow that you're like, oh, the ADC didn't pull damage before dying, and you, you'd rather see someone like pull 400 damage on a tank and then die instantly, and you call it like a good performance, then we have no yes. point talking together, right? It's yes. like we, we need to go past the point of like who does the damage and try to understand that positionally in terms of early game opening, like it was a chase game where like Carmen Cobb didn't know their openings. They, they were not even able to open with a solid, like robust position yep. from the first 15 minutes of the game, which shows that they were fine when the laners didn't shit the bed. That's literally this, that just Saken didn't play well. And I think everybody's kind of scared to say that, that just Saken didn't play well. I, I don't have problem with that. I think he can just play better. And, and and that's it. Like, if he plays better next split, if Saiken comes back and plays at least the level he was playing in DRL, you're going to see Carmen come playing better. And you know what people would say? Oh, yeah, the coaching staff changed. Was oh, much sure, better. of course. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's true. That <laughs> that's, is, the that worst, be the that's the worst. They're going to be like, yes. yeah, I think there was definitely something that happened. And it's like, oh, okay. It's like Yamato just in slapping the hands of Saiken whenever he touched the mouse <laughs> on stage or something. I don't know. I There is hopes. Fans of KC, if there are some that still listen... Uh, to you because I know a lot of, of them are angry against you. <laughs> they might hate watching it. Maybe they hate watching the whole process something horrible. It could be. I, I know there is a there is a thing on the internet where you go intentionally listen to people you disagree with yeah. to drop a hate comment. Um, I think there is a lot of hope for Carmen. It's just one of the hardest teams to make work. I think if they went for for Niski or someone like Eka, they would have had a very easy time. They went with Saken because I understand the legacy. Yeah, sure. But with the profile and the and the carry he had, there was a high chance this would happen. It's happening. No figure out how to fix it. That's ball is on your side, Carmen Cop. And by the way, as you since you admitted you yourself are like the biggest ball fan ever, here's the difference, right? Even though people did sadly rewrite his time in Vitality, like what they do with both upset and ball, you know, it's just they pretend the spring split never happened. They just pretend it was winter only and they lost every game and they were both bad. Here's the difference, right? I will totally admit that by by they got to the summer last year in Vitality, even ball looked broken. Like not he did not play the carries anymore. Even the way he played, you could tell it was just like this, this team's just broken. Like we're basically just waiting for the split to end. The difference difference is, even when this team lost a million games, dude, he kept playing like he was his actual style, he kept playing to his strength and I tell you what, I'll give him mad props because not only did everyone hear those voice comms where he was very vocal and he was trying to tell people, he was almost pleading with people, mate, to do the players, but also, he kept going for the players, like, mate, I'll tell you right now, I don't fucking play jungle, but if I offer all jungle and I even play with a random solo queue game and people don't go in, I'm going to go, fuck these guys, I'm just going to go get some selfish gang and lose the game, but at least I'm not going to be the one the, the worst feeling in the world, I've always thought in league and the carries don't get this is when you're either the fucking tank top laner or the jungler that's trying to get get fed and go on the back line you go in and it's like you feel like everyone else took a step back instead of following in on you and then you're just getting wrecked by everyone looking like a fucking idiot and then the fan who doesn't know goes what a stupid didn't think he did a hillisang angle meanwhile you know that if they followed up we actually could have won that team fight that is probably the worst feeling in the game so I actually will say this that's an up that's another positive for Carmen Cop. dude Bo actually didn't look like he got broken this split. He looked like he kept trying. So if you could fix some of the other things, he could actually potentially do something in this league. Yeah, I mean, for sure, there is a Bo. I've seen him with Maokai ring four times and see his team just like, oh, should we? Oh, no. Uh, uh, yes. Oh, 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 no. Eventually we go. And you see Bo dying eventually because of the three or four seconds of his team just doing back and yes. forth. Like, is he mad or is he a genius? Is he mad or is he a genius? Oh, he's a genius. Let's go. And I'm like, Guys, you should listen to him. Yes. I'm, I'm promising to you, he is a bloody genius. Like what he sees, very few people see it. Yes. So there is a very simple way to fix Carmen Corp is make sure that mid lane doesn't lose hardcore in the first 15 minutes of the game. Stabilize, don't try to play anything fancy. Play front to back and let Bo 
whenever he goes somewhere, you stop thinking and you click. And if you die, same thing. Mad Lions does that with Elio. Yes. Yeah, yes. The level of trust they, the they, they, always, they just, have. The joke is, I don't even think they always know if it's going to work. They just do it. They just trust him, like you say. They just know, tell exactly. you, oh, yeah, bro, let's play for him. Yeah, of course. Of course. But you know, it's, it is, it is, uh, it is in League of Legends, it's so much better to be wrong together. Yes. BDS takes shit fights, but they do it together. G2 ends a lot of time, but they do it together. The problem with Casey is they're trying to play an optimal League of Legends in which everybody has their own opinion. Stop this. Just, guys, admit you're not the shot caller. When Bo goes, you go, you click your button, and if you die, it's fine. GG next split. And then if it doesn't work at the end of the year, you just choose an, a, a different exactly. jungler. But if yes. you get Bo, for the love of God, play with him. Yes. Yes. I, I totally agree. Especially because, again, just like with certain other players we mentioned... There's no point having him if you're just going to tell him to play Sichuani and fucking just Get like... Syncroft. Yeah, Keep like, Syncroft. The it's joke cheaper. is, why bother at that point in time? Like, the whole point is, this guy does have this talent, this real mechanical talent, and also has, like you say, he has a crazy vision for how to like dominate. By the way, I'll just straight up say, I've said it on other shows, but I get, this is one of those teams I have gone and asked a whole bunch of people about what were they like in scrims during the split, before the split. Dude, there are players, big name LEC players, who tell me, oh, I'm actually shocked Carmine's that bad because the ball guy is a demon in scrims they tell me like he has scrims where he just wins the whole thing in 10 minutes and you're like fuck what was our jungler supposed to do and it's like he looks like a god so the, unless it's some very and here's the key thing as well he has done it on stage like that it's not it's one thing if there's the story of like a scrim god but they never do it on stage he's doing it they just don't play the same way they do in scrims clearly in scrims i bet they don't give a fuck there's no fear Saka probably presses R. there's no pressure i bet it, i bet it did look great in scrims i bet it makes sense even so another one where bizarrely i'm actually not totally out on this team i don't know the coaching thing that i'm scared about that, but I still think if mate, if you have players like fucking bought and upset, there's a way we can make this work. I mean, I'll even tie a more explicit one together, which is I think fucking bore. This is the reason I think upset joined this team with him again. That's my dream fucking jungler. If I'm upset, think about how upset likes to play a team fight. I want this guy all the way on the back line while I'm as far back as possible, just fucking kiting everyone. And they can't. The joke is while he's on their back line, they can't get to mine. I'm the one fucking kite back killing them all. This is dream jungle. I have. <laughs> I think the, the players that have the, the biggest edge to play with Bo would be irrelevant because this guy plays actually on the edge all the time. Bo, I would say Vitio. Vitio is so good at playing on the edge. Uh, upset. And in terms of supports, it's Mikix all the time. Oh, but sure. Probably you, you got to find someone, but you could be Twimby or something. Yes. This team would actually be a challenger for G2. I think if you put these five players together, if G2 is not ahead from the early game, I think they lose fight. It's like a Genji. You know, it would be European yeah. Genji. It's just sad because... Uh, and that's that's what I had in mind when they assembled this this Carmen Corp. I was like, you probably don't have the, it's it's when you get a forty ninety, uh, you know, from Nvidia, but you have a Intel Celeron. Not, <laughs> they are not a Celeron because that's, I'm that's being great too, analogy. I'm, be, I'm being too mean. No, no, but just an old uh, like the i five or something. There you go, an i five yeah, Intel. Yeah, exactly. You, you're just you know you're just CPU uh, capped. Like yes. your CPU cannot process the amount of data. That's how I feel with with Carmine. I'm like. If the solo laners and the and the supports don't stand stand up to the point where they can enable uh, these two guys, then it's kind of a no point. You should have worse players that will just play a front to back team yes. fight and be be expectations are too high. Maybe I don't know. I, I think they can pull it, but there is a lot of individual work to do with Cabo. Uh, oh, we sure. haven't spoken about Cabo, but Cabo, Saken, and Targamas needs to step up a little bit. No, no, I'm with you. Essentially, I would say it this way. To a fan, especially if they're a hater, they're going to go, all the players are bad and they could never win a game. No, no. As, I, that's why I think your, your metaphor is brilliant, actually. If people don't understand, especially old school people who've made their own PCs, having the best graphics cards are relevant if your fucking motherboard and your chip is shit because it's not going to make use of it. So what's the point in having the absolute best graphics card? You've got to, you've got to enable it so that then it can do what it can do. So the point here is if you have born upset, bro, I don't even need any of these three players to be like really good. You could all be the sixth best top player, the sixth best middler, the sixth best. That's probably enough. We'd probably win a bunch of games here. And wait, here's the thing we'd at least be in the mix. We'd at least be in like the fourth, fifth, sixth spot, winning games, mixing it up with the vitalities of the world, the SKs and the wreck. We'd be right there. We'd be right there. There is no competition. I agree with you. It's like, it's not, it's not the bar is super high. Like, no, we haven't no. even spoken about heretics yet. We're going to get to Rogue. Next, there is SK. So, Giant X. So, for, for these reasons, I agree with you. I feel like if they it just passed the bar of the five out of 10, and, and they let Bo and Upset do, and they just firmly believe these guys have something, and, and the team moves that way, I think they're going to be in playoffs next split, and they might even be dangerous.
Yes. Okay, so then let's talk about heretics. So you did have heretics a lot lower than me. You had them six. Now, listen, I was absolutely on that. I even admitted it on that G2 Hopium 2018. I had them second, guys, which, listen, now does look absolutely bonkers. Although I will say the worst thing about this one, this actually hurts me inside the team, is they had the audacity to even tease me that first week. Like, they actually get... Dude, the first week, Perks even gave me, like, crazy hope. Like, oh, God, he is back. Oh, shit. This could be fucking awesome. I still think, by the way, the player actually people were a bit harsh on was. I think Wonder was actually all right most of the split. But here's my biggest Rich problem, time. right? Even though I will always say with perks, everyone telling me he's shit now. You also said that like the last two years, guys, which he wasn't. He was just like gradually getting worse and worse. Now he is fairly bad. The really shocking one to me, mate, has to be Yankos. Like, mate, I, I, I didn't even think it was possible for Yankos to be anything but like just really fucking good. He looked like he was a bit off his pace as well. And then the real irony is, even though everyone critiqued the bottling, I think Flackett actually just, just really does his job really well. And actually, even though he got replaced, Kaiser was way better than I expected. Like, this team was such a mess overall, though, because remember, like I said with the Hopium, the whole premise was topside was going to carry. And that really wasn't what this team was. In fact, if anything, it was a lack of carries in topside that was kind of fucking them a bit. So what do you think of Rex? Why, why were they so kind of just weak willed by the end I mean the problem when you look at this team heretics right this is literally what I said uh, I think in the previous episode is there is five weak side players five players that are waiting for right. someone to carry they have been if you just look at draft for instance there is a very good instance where they leave they're, they're on the red side so they leave the jungle pick to last pick and they have pretty solid lanes so Usually, if you have winning lanes, for instance, what G2 would do, they would go with the Lilia or the Zac, you know, getting something that will get a, a, a huge threat based on how much he farms. And if he, if the champion gets enough farms, the game is over. That's pretty much how Lilia works. So like, if she's ahead of the curve, you can't really do anything against her. And Yanko speaks Trundle. And you're like, this, this is going to be bad, guys. Like, the year is going to be terrible. Because it means that if you drop to five red side and your best champ to win this game, with and most of the champions they had before that were not very carry champions. They were champions that were waiting for this final slot to kind of counter the whole comp against them from farming. The... And I was like, oh, okay, they're out of resources. They don't just don't have it. And Perks is playing like he was playing at C9. It was pretty much like... I don't see any difference. I don't think he's worse. I think people have a very bad judgment of him because of the, his legacy. But he was already playing that way when he was at C9. And people were content with it because the level in NA was not great. He came back, was a little bit better in Vitality. But I think he's kind of his range post, post playing ADC. I think Perks is doing his level. The problem I have, the, the clear two warnings I have is yeah, the bot lane not being able to carry. The jungle not being able to carry. And the top lane not being able to carry. So you have this guy, Perks, that's like has a lot of great ideas and... Uh, all it takes in League of Legends after 25 minutes is one guy saying one smart thing. Yes. Because most of the time, five players don't know what they're doing. By the way, so it's, a it's, one thing me and, it's one thing me and Dom have always said, which is why we did ride with perks to the bitter end. It's because it's like, look, I've never said he was some god laner, guys. But like you say, if you get to like the mid and late game, he can make the one flank or the one call that wins you the game. Yeah, that's, and that's what we were always banking on. The problem is it doesn't happen in this team. That's all. I mean, you, the problem is, it's like the call is not. I had this very specific scenario because, and I knew heretics would not be good because I've made this decision in the past. And right. someone criticized me heavily for making this team, and it was Larson. I remember Larson wrote this team will not even make it to the to the, out of pools in U Masters. There is no carry to play through. And I was like, who is this Larson guy? Why is he criticizing my team? Lila, did I know that was completely wrong and he was completely right? right. I had Soaz, Xmithy, and Aka. Three guys that just want to play for their team, right? Yeah. But that's exactly the same DNA. It's like I had a utility bot lane, I had a Haku and Altec back then. And it's like this duo lane just wants to kind of 50 50 and they're going to do right? some Go damage. Even. Yes. Yes. And, and, and then it's just like my games were like, oh, so Soaz would make it like a really good call or XMC would make a really good call. It's like, guys, after this, they're going to recall. We can just run up and get into their face in their jungle. And my team will actually do the right call. They will walk into the jungle, wait into the bush, and enemy team will face check them. I'll be like, okay, guys, that's a W. 5 4 0. And I'm like, what happens? Like, oh, we didn't execute the fight. And that's where you get the carries. You need one or two guys that are actually able to win these fights. And if you can't win these fights, you can't win the game, no matter how good your macro is. And the problem with heretics is if you give them upset and trimby, then it's fine. They're going to yes. be great. They're going to at least be top four. The problem is if you have this bot lane that just want to wait and go with the flow 
and nobody else in the map is able to make a breakthrough, you end up with a goal deficit of 1.5k and you're already bad in team fight. And yes. then you can't do anything. So you see people just throwing bodies for 25 minutes and you're like, where is this team going? And I don't think Twimby is going to change anything because he's not a carry. They have even more utility to enable no one. That's the, my problem with them. And here's the, here's the one... What's funny is, even though I just said he's not the player I'll flame... The problem I have with Wonder in this team goes like this, Sabatine. I've done interviews with this guy in this recent off-season. I've talked to him over the years when he was in G2 and then when he was in Fnatic. And here's my problem. In those teams, the logic went, well, even though he could be the carry, we could play through him. Well, we've got Caps and then that, that amazing G2 bot lane or we've got Opset and fucking Humanoid. Of course we're not going to. Look, he's actually so good, well-rounded top laner. He could just be the weak sider and, you know, he'd give him the odd Renekton and he'll like, even get some kills and do some... No, no, here's the problem. On this team, the story was supposed to be, but he could still be old wonder. Like, he could be a carry. It's not that he, he isn't good. He just doesn't play carry, mate. Like, he is the fucking guy that is just going to play fucking Udir and Cassante. Like, he's not going to be the guy who pulls out some... Ma like, the Merwin guy... Is a rookie and he's way more of a carry than this guy's, and he doesn't even get played to. Like, that's the downside. Is like, one day is still good, but I can see he can't be the primary carry. Oh, like, he isn't at the moment. He's not doing it. He's, like, for whatever reason, he's just not done that role. That, and I was kind of hoping again that he would be like, I actually hoped he would just come and smash the league, and that he was kind of like, you know, he was sick of being the weak side. It was time to be a, a king carry, but it doesn't even seem like he's done that. No, I agree. I mean, it's, uh, we have some carries. We have Adam that actually plays pretty pre uh, with pressure. Mirwin, I would agree. Uh, I think there is a case for R11 that actually plays way more aggro than he should. Photon is a really good example. It's just when you build a team, you need brains and you need muscle. They just have a little bit too much brain, you know. Oh, by the way, there's another trade the we could do. Look, I don't know if someone would want it, but Photon for fucking Wonder. There's another interesting swap, right? Yeah, I mean that that would do that would do wonders <laughs> for the pun. But yeah, I mean vitality window sounds sounds like because if you notice, I'm trying not them. to be I'm trying not to be like an idiot fan. Like, hey, they should trade their best player to us for our ship. I'm trying to make like equivalent trades that could fix both teams. Yeah. You know, sure. But imagine, I'm just sad because I feel like they could have had a wonder and VTO, and they would have had an insane team. I think sure. this team with VTO, and I have absolutely no problem. Like, it's not me being against perks. It's just I do not firmly believe that Perks is the player he he was I say this before the split and it's still the case the the last time Perks was the best mid laner in the LEC was in 2017 oh, it's, it's a time little ago. bit yes yeah it's it was seven years ago man it's uh because after he played he played uh in 2018 there was there was uh caps that was so he was runner-up he was still good yes and then 2019 happened so since 2019 pretty much we haven't seen Perks as a leading mid laner in the west so for this reason, I feel like having VTO was balancing this team way more. So no, I would have changed the bot lane as a whole. I would have sent probably Flacket to a team that needs a weak side ADC and I would have taken like a strong snowballing bot lane like Exaki and Dos or something like that. Yes. Oh, by the way, I, tell, I, I also will say, if, if I think of Vethio's like, strengths and weaknesses, I think he would fucking love playing with Yankos. Man, that's like the dream jungler for him. Like, oh, you really liked sure it. I mean, it. I can yes. tell you. <laughs> it's like, I mean, he's playing with really good players in, in, in yeah. Vitality. I think it's, uh, but of course, when you're, uh, when you're a mid laner and he hasn't played with the best jungle, like he sure. played with Razork and then he had Zenza, which I, and, 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 uh, Shlatan, which weren't that good. And then he had, uh, Cersei. Uh, Cersei. And then he finally got <laughs> Yankos just in the last one. Yeah. And so, and then he got Yankos and he was like, man, that feels so good. Like this guy understands. So yes. I, I really felt like, you know, there are moments where you watch the offseason, it's like, this is a grief move. And really, like, setting VTO for perks to me was a grief move. I was like, because it's perks, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. But I think my worries were confirmed in the early part of the year. And although I, I know, like, Trimby is just a significant upgrade from Kaiser, so it's going to make them better. But I don't think at core it fixes their problem. Yes. Right. We only have one team left. And the reason I did leave until last is we even all both picked him to be first. Like this wasn't even a split guys where I even tried to come up with another angle. Like the problem is on paper, this team should win the LEC. It did win the LEC, 
Yeah, listen, I will say they still had some like laws early on that were a bit weird, but by the time the playoffs got going and each series went on, by the end of the LEC, they looked far away the best. Like, yeah, they are, they're just a dope team. I mean, by the end, the joke was they're very different to last year's team. Like, last year's team was like the ultimate Western snowball team. They would just get ahead, they win through every lane, no one could stop them. Like, this time, there was a little bit more problems. Like, in the final, the bot lane was a bit dodgy, but mate, I'll tell you one thing right now that's really positive if you're a G2 fan. Bro, he didn't do it every game, but there were some games where Caps really did do like old school cap, like prime cap shit where he just fucking, yeah. like when he does that, I was saying this on the show I did with Rich, the side select, I had to pick him as my MVP because even though normally you'd want to be like, yeah, but he's on G2, they've got all the best, it's like, bro, the difference is though, when he goes to like that 10 out of 10 level, no one can, no one can do that. No one else can do that right now. Like the other players, it's not the strongest mid lane pool anyway, but no one else can do like, he does the game where I really do think like, bro, am I watching someone who actually could like clap the LPL? Like this is fucking, this guy's nuts. So, it's understandable they won the league when they are just the best team. Where are you, where are you yeah, on I this mean, team? It is. The, nothing that I'm going to say has not been uh, has been said before. It's just um, this G2 team is is uh, is fighting. You know, it's just ghost posting itself, like uh, boxing itself. Sorry. Uh, you know, they Shadow are just boxing. training against themselves. Yes. Shadow boxing, sorry. Uh, I, I feel like they are at a point where they... They beat Weibo. I feel like people forgot that the Weibo team they beat yes. was uh, was come was the one that made the final. For, yeah, for, for and they beat them from right like a 10k depth. Because what the fuck it was? That was pretty crazy. Yeah, I, I, I that beat BLG right. That was the winner of Genji. So there is no transitivity in uh, in esports and in sports in general. But that gives you a, a framework. Of like they didn't beat them because Weibo was was bad. They beat them because they, 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 G two is a legit team. And I think they are. You know, you have all the indicators of a of a successful team. Like the the scrim results on st on international tournaments are good. You look at the scrim results locally; they're good. So they are one tra one transition away of being a contender for worlds. You know, like if they can transition what they do on scrim on stage and keep their composure and kind of beat their nemes their nightmares of kind of choking on stage internationally, they are f they are on the verge of finishing the League of Legends game. So they're not definitely not playing on the same level as the LEC. I think if they were playing in the in the LCK, they would not be tenth, which is the best compliment I can give to a uh, yeah, uh, yeah. European team. Yes, it just feels so heartbreaking for us consumers of the LEC that, and that's why I'm probably that upset against Natic. That they don't have a real rival, no, do they? There's no one can actually. I, test I them. really need someone and. That's very good that BDS is trying to take that yeah, role, yeah. but I don't think that uh, in their development, I don't think BDS is at the point they they should be a runner-up. There's also they an unfair be... quality. Like, here's why Zabatine, it would be unfair to expect BDS to. Because BDS is playing really well as a team, but so is G2. And then G2 has really good players. They also have amazing roster construction. Like, I'll tell you what, I was a little bit questioning myself on, like, the Yike guy when he first came in. Because, dude, dude you could have had a Yankos, you could have had El Yoya. He's got better every split, mate. Like, that guy is just one of the top players now. Again, if I take the name off, I wouldn't know it wasn't an elite European player. The whole team's really good. Yeah, everybody's good. I mean, Caps is better than ever. Yike is probably for me second best jungler or third best with, uh, I think that um, Razork has been the best jungler this split to my eyes and Yike probably second and Edelia third. But, but overall, there is no flows because you know the patch is going to change. You know BDS is going to be annoyed. You know maybe Heretic is going to be a little bit better and stuff. You know G2, no matter what the patch is, yes. if it's Jinx versus Aphelios, if it's Xayah Rakan, like, he doesn't care. He will be uh, here and uh, they will be here and they will be actually the best team. The only thing that's really bitter for me is just the fact that if we want this team to actually show something internationally, we need the top teams, the teams that have the best players, meaning, hey, hey uh, Vitality, Natic, the, the, the teams that spend the money on getting the best player at their position, they need to play as a team in a way that BDS becomes this gatekeeper and keeps improving because I think BDS will be right probably even in a year or two. And, and, and But we need to challenge right now. And I, I'm just sad that the rest of the league is kind of shitting the bed with the quality, the individual quality we have. Because there is definitely a world, as you said, with trade or something where we have the same caliber of player in every single lane. Like it's yes. not, you can never beat BB or there is not a single mid laner that can actually face cap. So we know it's the, we have uh, factual track records of people yes. challenging them individually. But then it's never five players that do that. And 
because oh it's five players but then there is no system so i'm waiting for the uh, the lec to actually provide an actual challenge for g2 because the problem is it's doing a disservice for the whole project i don't know what you think about it but i feel like the lec is so with the the the, the fact that g2 is so good and the format being so bad i feel like i'm watching the lms and flash wolf is winning every year no, I know what you mean. Like, this is the only time ever I actually really did think there was no competition. Even in past years, like, look, there was more like, like, at least I had hope for people that th this really was the only one where, like, from week one till the end, it's like, no one should beat this team. No one should. Yeah. Oh. And the, oh, oh, by the, the way, you, you notice, yeah. this is how you know that the LEC's fucked if they don't, like, level up the teams, get the better styles, or make some player trades. Because we didn't even mention that, as well as all the thing, the playing style, the strength of the players, or all the form. Oh, they also probably have the best drafting coach in the fucking LEC, and he still finds, he still manages to catch most teams out and find some angle on them and fucking flex a pick, and, oh, what a nightmare for the others. They have the best <laughs> performance system, man. I mean, I've, I've went to G2, and the facility, you know, uh, the general manager is my former general manager, so I had the chance to get a, a glance at what they do. Lord did too, as well. She went made a vlog there. Right. I, I am fairly confident in saying that uh, outside of China, and I said it, I think, previously in your uh, review, it's like, I think it's the best environment to play League of Legends for in, in the world outside of China. I don't even, I'm not even sure that T1, I haven't checked all the practice of T1, but I'm not even sure T1 is doing what G2 does. Put it this way, if people don't know, I've often told people that an area the West could get ahead in is in Asia, they often do have quite a limited coaching stuff. So sometimes they don't have, like, they don't do that NRG approach, guys, and CLG and get, like, five different coaches. They sometimes just have the two guys and then, like, an assistant or something. So I'm with you. Like, for all we know, T1 might be the best team. They might win worlds, but that doesn't mean, actually, that they even necessarily have as good a system because, obviously, the players are different, right? I'm with you. It's possible. Whereas, that's, whereas yeah, if you I just mean, look how China many years has... and how many players you've swapped in now, it's basically only caps that remains. And then Mickey X even went at one point. Like, they're just always the best. Yeah, so they, they must be the environment. It has to be. In in China, like, you have a guy that just looks at worlds. You know, this is this level of granularity. You have a guy that's like, okay, the world, the world patterns for this match is this one. And the players, like, hit maps and stuff. It's like Counter-Strike, yes. you know, Counter-Strike. When data came, like, the game kind of got revolutionized. Yes. I think they are there. So that's why I, I don't want to count on China. But I think outside of China... The, 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 the combination between uh, optimization of the training process, optimization of the well-being of the player and their, uh, and their wellness overall, and, and the culture of efforts and overcoming the hurdles, like this combination of three is, is what makes G2 stand out. And I'm pretty sure that if you're a, a young player and you move to G2 now, you, your improvement is going to be twice as fast as any other team. And that's why Yike is so good. is because they came and they're like, they're forming him at becoming a G2 player. And that that's different than just become, be, being an LEC player. So this is where it feels very unfair. Is uh, you need exceptionally good humans to actually build staff like Mac, like Striker, that are able to have such a coherent approach of the game that they are able to cherry pick the players and assemble something. Because against them, there is a machine that is the most attractive. It's probably one of the richest and has the best culture and practice uh, program for any player. So to beat them, it's very hard. But this is where the teams that have the money and the players should just invest in good stuff and then they could actually match. And then I'd also say this detail, because I'm actually going to take a tweak on an old narrative I've had. I did kind of think before, like it could certainly be considered by some teams a bit BM to like leak the scrim results and say who was winning against who and that. And I know that was like a big for all when it initially happened, because obviously the one that everyone backlashed on is it did look like he did that at MSI to make up for the fact the result wasn't good. It was a way of sort of being like, hey, we're still really sick though. And then when they didn't make top eight at world, same thing, like, hey, we were beating JDG or whatever. It's, like, it's a pretty cool angle. But I'll say this, domestically, that angle is gangster and here's why because we already know they win all the officials and now we know every single split they just smash everyone in scrims like that mate by the way if you're actually remain essentially that's the best advert for what you were part of creating at G2 it's like essentially we must just have the best approach not only to the official but just the whole game of League of Legends right? you're right they've killed it because I mean what, what's there to argue with the results are there in every domain in every player it's gangster yeah, and if they if they close the gap between their screen performance on, uh, in the, in MSI or Worlds and stage, then what do you want to say about this team? Yes. Because you know, and and the thing is, G two is so much bigger than any of its individualities. If tomorrow Caps is not good enough, if if G two and Caps part way, you're gonna be like, oh, they have a better mid laner. You're never gonna think, oh, 
Caps is going to a better team. No, there is no such thing as a better team than G2. You know that if Caps is not in G2, it means he's not the best anymore. There is a guy that's better than him. And so the competition to keep your spot at G2 is, stems from the fact that the culture at G2 is you have to be the best to play at G2. And that thing comes from like a legacy of good choices that have like stacked on top of each other and eventually leads into this. I am waiting to see like BDS is taking that way, uh, that, that path. And I think we'll have a strong BDS eventually the way they are in Rocket League and stuff. I'm just waiting for the mentality to shift in the West and uh, in the LEC for teams to realize that like this winter split doesn't mean shit. You need to build this culture in a way that you can eventually challenge G2. Right. As I mentioned on all the episodes, Dominate did tell me I have to have a closer. I can't just cut on the hard cut, which I do for all the other shows still because fuck everyone, right? But so all I'll say is this. All you need to know is we will be back with the Best Damn League show for the spring split, but you have to ask yourself, take a guess now, who will be the co-host? Spoiler, I don't actually know. So if it's a perfect time to guess, maybe you'll be right. Maybe you'll be wrong. Let's see. Answers in the comments below. Now, the LEC split has obviously finished for now. We're waiting for the next split, the spring split, to come along. But there's plenty of League of Legends that you can go out there and still bet on. You can still bet on most of the other big leagues, the LCK, the LPL. You can go and bet on things like CB LOL. You can go over here. You've got the LFL. You've got the LLA, which is like Latin America one or whatever. You've got the LVP, the Superliga from Spain. You've got the NLC, the UK one, the NACL, the Challenger League thingamajig over in North America. You've got all sorts of VCS, TC, VCS is Vietnam, TCL is obviously Turkey. There's loads of League of Legends to bet on. And as usual, they have all sorts of different odds. They have the handicaps. They have all sorts of different types of bets. So check out Esports Bet where you can still get more for your crypto at Esports Bet.